Good evening, and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. The regular meeting of the City Planning Commission will be called to order, and we will begin with a few introductory remarks. The City of Sioux Falls Planning Commission serves as an advisory board to the City Council. It is the responsibility of the Planning Commission to consider and make recommendations on land use and zoning matters. Conditional use permits and minor amendment requests will have final action here this evening unless appealed to the City Council in writing within five days. Any decision made on preliminary subdivision plans or future land use amendment requests tonight will be referred to the City Council for final action at the third council meeting of the month. Any decision made on rezoning requests, major amendments, or ordinance amendments tonight will be referred to the City Council for final action at the first council meeting of the month. Council meetings are held at 7 p.m. here in the Carnegie Town Hall and are televised. Any action taken here tonight on a final development plan is final. The Planning Commission will first approve the consent agenda and then the regular agenda. In order to place certain non-controversial items on the Commission's consent agenda, Planning staff and the Planning Commission applies the following criteria. First, the request conforms with the City 2015 Land Use Plan. Second, the planning staff recommends approval of the request. And third, there are no audience members present or written comments received in opposition to the request. And fourth, the application meets all conditions and requirements of the ordinance. Once the consent agenda items are approved, you are free to leave. For the regular agenda, the following normal public hearing procedure will be followed. By first requesting planning staff to present a brief report on each item, Second, the petitioner will be requested to come forward and make a statement or answer questions. After the petitioner, anyone from the audience who wishes to address a particular agenda item shall be recognized. Then, the Planning Commission will discuss the matter further and take appropriate action. We ask that anyone addressing the Planning Commission other than staff move to the podium microphone, identify themselves, and state their address for the record. Please limit your comments to less than five minutes. As a courtesy to everyone here tonight, we ask you please either turn off or silence your cell phone and pager. This meeting is being televised on Channel 16 and will be rebroadcast Saturday at 10 a.m., Tuesday at 7 p.m., and Wednesday at 1 a.m. Thank you for your cooperation. Good evening and welcome. Um, at this time, we will read the consent agenda. If anyone has um, a, um, if anyone would like to move an item from the consent agenda to the regular agenda, we will be asking for that information after we've read the um, the consent agenda. Number one is the approval of April first, two thousand nine, minutes of the regular meeting. Number two is plats. Number three, two zero zero nine dash zero four dash two zero a rezone from the RA Residential District to the Eastern Hills Plan Development District for allowed uses at 4200 South Sycamore Avenue. Number 4, 2009-03-23, a major amendment in the sub-area C of the Diamond Valley Plan Development District to add eight plexes as an, an allowed use at 1105 West 73rd Street. Number five. 2009-04-05, conditional use permit in the C2 General Commercial District to allow a truck terminal at 1400 North Cliff Avenue. Number six, 2009-04-08, conditional use permit in the C2 General Commercial District to allow a daycare center at 3812 North Cliff Avenue. Number seven, 2009-04-11, conditional use permit in the RD Residential District to construct two fourplexes and one threeplex at West 41st Street and T. Ellis Road. Number eight, 2009-04-12, conditional use permit in the RD Residential District to allow fourplexes at South Grinnell Avenue and West Snapdragon Street. Number nine, 2009-04-13, conditional use permit in the C3 
Central Business District to allow an on-sale alcohol establishment at 221 South Phillips. Number 10, 2009-04-16, conditional use permit in the C2 General Commercial District to allow motor vehicle sales and display at 3910 West 12th Street. Um, number 11 has been withdrawn. Number 12, 2009-04-15, a minor amendment in subarea A of the North Ridge Plan Development District to allow a six-foot fence along the north and east property lines at 4200 West Kathleen Street. Number 13, 2009-04-19, Final development plan in sub-area C of the Rolling Heights Plan Development District to allow construction of an office building at West 69th Street and Southwestern Avenue. Number 14, 2009-04-21, final development plan in sub-area A of the Heather Ridge 2 Plan Development District at 7512 South Grand Arbor Court to construct a private community center. And that concludes the, um, the consent agenda. Does anyone ha want or uh, have an, uh, an item that they would like to move to the regular agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda has been approved. Now we will move to the regular agenda. Number 15. Madam Chair, I have a request to uh, defer item 16 on the regular agenda. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the regular agenda with the item number 16 deferred? Madam Chair, I'd move to approve the revised regular agenda. Second. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. The regular agenda has been approved. Okay, number. F oh, sorry. Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's been, or, um, a motion's been approved. Okay, number 15. This is a recognition of service for Anita Wetch and Teresa Boysen. If I could have you both stand forward for me. Anita began her service on the Planning Commission on May 17, 1999, and is continuing through to today. And Teresa began on May 1st in 2004. For the last 10 and 5 years, respectively, you have exemplified civic dedication and pride in Sioux Falls by serving on the City Planning Commission. In your Planning Commission service, you have attended hundreds of City Planning Commission meetings, including the Joint City County Planning Commissions in Minnehaha and Lincoln County. Served on various study groups and made recommendations to City Council for ordinance revisions supported the adoption of the 2015 Growth Management Plan in 2003, participated in thousands of public hearings, hearing recommendations to the City Council, and Anita, you have served as Commission Chairperson and Vice Chairperson. Your civic dedication and pride is also demonstrated by the manner in which you have had outstanding meeting attendance, served on various task force committees, and supported the Sioux Falls planning and public hearing processes. You have adhered to the spirit of the City's comprehensive plans for the betterment of Sioux Falls and all its citizens. Your most recent planning commission efforts included, par include participating in laying the foundation for joint jurisdictional planning and zoning with Lincoln County and shape Sioux Falls. You are both amazing as you have found time to balance your careers as professionals and civic volunteers. On behalf of city officials, Mayor Munson, city council members, past and current planning commissioners, the planning staff, and all other city employees, it is truly my pleasure to present to you this evening a token of our sincere appreciation for your years of dedicated service on the City Planning Commission. Members of the audience, please give Ms. Mrs. Wetch and Mrs. Boysen a, round, a warm round of applause.
Anita mm -hmm. and Teresa, the, the members of the Planning Commission would also like to thank you for your service. It's been a pleasure to serve with you. We will miss you both. Thanks. It's been fun. We will miss you after the summer is over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now we will move, uh, number 16 has been deferred, so we will move on to number 17. It's a rezone from the Ag uh, Agricultural District to the RS2 and RD Residential Districts in the University Hills Plan Development District for allowed uses at northwest corner of West 54th Street North and North Marion Road. Staff report. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Steve Randall. I'll be representing planning staff on this item and others this evening. <clears throat> this item uh, you have seen before is a future land use plan amendment uh, that was approved by the City Council in April. They're proceeding with uh, rezoning and subdivision of the property at the present time. The concept has not changed. It was presented to you as a concept of mixed use. Uh, they've identified a planned development district to accommodate the mixed uses and they provided a subdivision plan that includes a transition of land uses between adjacent properties and the subject property. <clears throat> it's an 81.3 acre site and so uh, they have indicated in their application with a plan development, initial development plan, a preliminary subdivision plan, uh, plan development subarea regulations, and conceptual design sketches, uh, the character of development that they wish to proceed with at this time. Currently to the north, uh, we have some I-1 light industrial zoning occupied by the, uh, presently by ADP and some vacant property around that. To the south, it's zoned RA1, RD, RS2, which is also currently vacant, but has been approved for development. <clears throat> to the east, it's the University Center Plan Development District, uh, which is approved for development and is currently under construction. And to the west, it's uh, outside the city in the Minnehaha County, zoned agricultural. What they're proposing with their uh, initial development plan is a plan development district of 48.3 acres consisting of approximately 13 lots. They're also proposing RD, residential development, for the development of twin homes, duplexes, and so on, allowed uses, as 5.2 acres on six lots. <clears throat> and you can see by the exhibit that serves as a transition from the planned development district, which includes commercial uses, to the low density single family residential shown in bright yellow. The planned development district intent is to uh, provide a unique use of open space or other desirable design features, which they have addressed in their concept plans. Perhaps we could take a look at the concept plans. Uh, as you see on the screen, the renderings indicate multi-story structures, which in a use or mixed-use concept would be vertical integration of uses with commercial uses on the ground floor and residential uses above. Maybe you've seen this in other communities where uh, mixed-use vertical development of the same building has been successfully accomplished. Basically, it allows for street parking for the commercial uses, and these are being proposed in the subdivision plan as private streets. Therefore, parking would be allowed in the right-of-way of those private streets uh, being constructed and maintained by the developer. Also, uh, the developer then would be able to go into theme lighting and be able to maintain and replace uh, lighting fixtures as they are needed and provide for other things within that district that uh, may not be allowed in a conventional zoning district, such as signage, um, banners, other special event kind of things, in a mix of uses. It's a unique concept, and staff has encouraged them to pursue that. And they are excited about pursuing it. 
In the sub-area regulations that have been included in your information packet, uh, the first sub-area is A, which is a horizontal mixed-use pedestrian-oriented development. It's a general mixing of land uses allowed, including permissive, permitted, special, and conditional uses in the RA1, O office, and all permitted, special, and conditional uses in the C4 district. As you can see that that sub-area A is at the northeast corner of the subject property next to a heavy arterial street and will provide a principal access point into the subdivision uh, through which uh, residents and commercial visitors alike will be able to access the mixed-use development. As a transition zone, it has to uh, meet the requirements of these sub-area regulations, and they've excluded a list of uses in your information packet, including campgrounds, kennels, motor vehicle display and sales, and so on. These uses, they feel, would not be appropriate to their type of development. And in a planned development uh, scenario, that is possible for them to do. The accessory uses would be those normally found. The density area, yard, and air height regulations would be the same as the C4 planned commercial district unless otherwise noted. And you can see under other regulations, there are some exceptions to those uh, regulations, those setback regulations in the C4 district, principally in the setback requirements. Uh, let's go through a, a few of those to make sure that they are correct and uh, uh, that the concept is being properly uh, presented. The first thing is that the developer proposes to present future final development plans that will be consistent with streetscape and horizontal mixed-use policies of Shape Sioux Falls. Shape Sioux Falls uh, land use and development policies have been recommended for approval and adoption by the city at the city council, and we expect those to be in place by the time final development plans will come through. Second one, when private streets incorporate interior planning Boulevards, <clears throat> excuse me, not less than 15 feet in depth, the required front yard will be zero. These planting boulevards will have living ground cover and incorporate plantings at a rate of one tree for every 25 feet of length and an accessible pedestrian walkway. What we're doing here is encouraging uh, full development of the site with pedestrian access. So the setbacks pedestri in a pedestrian-oriented environment bring the access points or entry points to the buildings closer to the pedestrian, which then allows the zero setback. It's one of the guiding features of a pedestrian-oriented development. In addition to required tree planting, street trees will be provided at a rate of one tree for every 50 foot of frontage along University Trail, Marion Road, and 54th Street North. This is to give a consistency of landscape treatment to the overall development. All landscaping will comply with minimum requirements of section uh, of the zoning ordinance unless otherwise indicated here. And direct pedestrian pathways shall be provided from public right-of-way to major building entrances and between buildings and sub-areas and multi-building developments. Harmonious design will be required and a master sign plan for sub-area A will be submitted to the planning director concurrently with the first final development plan application to the planning commission. That is sub-area A, and you'll notice that a lot of these other regulations then also apply to sub-areas B and C. So briefly to summarize B, that's a transitional zone where it's intended to include land use between the village center area and adjacent low-density land uses, which include single-family residential, as well as a development or existing development to the north. The uses permitted are those in the RA1, residential, permissive and permitted, special in the O office district. So there are no commercial uses allowed in that district. Density area and height are governed by the RA1 residential district, except where noted and under, under other regulations. And then you notice that under setbacks, when private streets incorporate interior planning boulevards not less than 15 foot in depth, the required front yard will be zero. That is also allowed in our conventional zoning district for RA1 on private streets. If you remember here not too long ago, we did 
change the ordinance to allow zero setback in RA1 on private streets. And will incorporate one tree for every 25 feet of length in a pedestrian walkway. In addition, the tree plantings, uh, they also have to conform to the normal landscaping requirements of the ordinance. The master sign plan will also be submitted uh, concurrently with the first final development plan and direct pedestrian pathways shall be provided from public right of way to major building entrances and between buildings and sub areas. And finally, sub area C is the village concept itself. And this is, if you will, the downtown of this development where University Village, Hills Village is designed as a vertical mixed use area where the scale and character of the sub area has a similar feel of a village, downtown, or town center district. These buildings have parking lots define the street and structures typically have two or more stories for vertical mixed use. All of the uses uh, allowed within the RC, the O office, the RA2, now a little higher density, and the C4 plant commercial district are allowed with the exception of the list that's included in your information packet. Basically what happens then, any use that comes into there has to meet those requirements if it's not listed as an allowed use and it's excluded on this list, it would have to come back for a rezoning basically, a major amendment to allow it. That gives uh, the developer some control as well as uh, the city has some guarantee that the property will be developed as presented. One unique feature about sub area, this sub area is a master parking plan required to be approved with the first final development plan. Off street parking provisions and all other zoning districts apply except that on street parking spaces may offset for one parking space up to 75% of commercial requirements or 30% of multifamily or office off-street parking requirements. In addition, shared parking reductions may apply when a final development plan demonstrates uses that share the same off-street parking lot. So basically, it's, it's kind of like the parking requirements of our central business district now where you have shared parking arrangements, you have mixed use occupancy, and you have on-street parking. So it, it's, we think it's an exciting concept to be developed in a, in a new setting and may even provide some insight as to how the downtown uh, could redevelop in the future. Sign regulations are consistent with the Shape Sioux Falls section on signage. And that pretty well describes it. There is a unique feature of the Village Square Park is to be at least two acres in size at a central location in the initial development plan <clears throat> and shall be used only for recreational purposes. Pedestrian access to this park shall be a priority, including on-street parking, crosswalks, and street uh, ball downs. And the park will be maintained by the developer or by an association of owners, property owners. That pretty much summarizes the unique features, I believe, unless the developer would like to expound on that. There is a natural conservation area, which is basically a best management practice for controlling stormwater runoff and water quality on the development. We've had two calls on this application from adjacent property owners, and perhaps they're here this evening and would like to speak. The calls were for information only. We have no objections to the development at this time. And uh, staff is recommending approval with the sub area regulations and the concept plan, initial development plan as presented. A little later in the agenda, we'll also present a preliminary subdivision plan for the same, same project. That concludes staff report. Any questions for Steve? Steve, can you um, can you help us understand on the on the north side where the RD comes? Is it industrial all the way across? It is where zoned it, industrial. That's correct. Do you have the zoning exhibit there? Yeah, you see the light blue across the top of the screen. <clears throat> so, is there a a road or anything planned? Nope. Through that piece. 
and we haven't seen any other plans for development around that property. We have not. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Steve? Thank you, Steve. Is the petitioner here, please? Hi, I'm Diane DeCoyer with Architecture Incorporated. Jared Smart with Universal Properties. Okay, any questions? Jared, this looks like a pretty exciting adventure. Uh, when are you going to get started on this? Is this. Uh... Well, um, we, we hope to move dirt this summer, possibly start construction on a building this fall if we can get everything approved in due time. So. Good luck to you. It Thanks. Looks, looks very interesting. Any other questions? When you say start construction, which piece, which sub area will you start in? Which? Um, sub area C, um, blocks, oh, let's see, is it block, a block of the mouse was just on? Okay. Um, sub area C, block seven, lot one, or actually it's lot two, the lot on the east side there, yeah, right there is where we intend to start construction of a building this fall. This fall. <laughs> What's the overall, how many people do you think will live in this development when you're done? Well, uh, in the, in the sub C, in the multifamily section, um, if we figure there's one and a half occupants per unit, uh, could be up to 1,400. In that, in that area, so it'd be roughly eight, 800 units, so some, somewhere in there. Small town. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just concur with what um, Kenny said. It's uh, great to see something as innovative and as creative as this, and I'm glad that um, uh, look forward to seeing what you put out there. Thank you. Can I make a comment? Sure. Um, as the first mixed-use development, um, in the city, we've been working really closely with the planning staff and just want to commend them for uh, their availability and their efforts in making sure that we get this moved along quickly. They've been a, a great assistance and, again, first project actually for Shape Sioux Falls. So we've, it's been a pleasure working with them. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this, uh, this issue? If not, call for the motion. I'll move. Madam Chair, I move for approval. I'll second. Motion's been approved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item 17 passes. Item number 18. 2009-03-21, a rezone from the Sanford USD Medical Center Plan Development District to the RS2 Residential District at 816 South Coval <laughs> Avenue. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. My name is Dave Loveland, and I'll be representing planning staff on this and uh, additional items this evening. You may remember that uh, last fall in November and December, the Planning Commission City Council considered a comprehensive rezoning north of the Sanford, of the current Sanford Health Campus. Um, part, of that was, uh, in, part of that was to incorporate the future expansion of the health system and some of the properties were owned by, were still owned by other, other uh, parties than Sanford Health. Uh, the applicant currently is requesting to zone his parcel, his property, back to the RS2 residential zoning that he was before the comprehensive rezoning was done. His parcel is about one, or 0.13 acres. And Sanford requested the properties to the north of their development up to West 16th Street, essentially be included in the plan development district to help define the campus's eventual northern boundary. Of, there were 65 individual properties included in the rezoning request, and of those, Sanford Health owns 39 of them. 26 were owned by private citizens. 
The City Council, after Planning Commission's recommendation, approved the rezoning on December 15th. And during that approval, the City Council requested that the Planning Office send certified letters to the individual property owners which explain the rezoning and provided the opportunity for the property owners to rezone back to their original zoning district. 25 of the 26 property owners received the letters. Um, the 26 we were unable to contact, uh, and those, the certifications were returned to us. Besides Mr. Scaff, no other property owners have requested to be removed from the PD at this time. Um, the location is on South Colville Avenue between 16th and 17th Street, essentially in the middle of the block. Um, South Colville Ad Avenue is, uh, is a right of way from which he takes his access. We are recommending that the Planning Commission approve of this rezoning, and we've received no calls on this item, so from either Sanford Health or other adjacent properties. That concludes staff report. Any questions for staff? Okay, thank you, Dave. Is the petitioner present? Yes, I'm Tom Scaff, and I live at 816 South Coble. And uh, last, uh, late last fall, Sanford invited us over there all the neighbors to give them us an idea of what they wanted to do at the time. They told us that we could, with, we could keep our property single family dwelling if we would like, and we had to March 31st to do so. Well, I went down to the zoning office approximately in the middle of March, and they told me that March 10th was the deadline. And I, <laughs> I said, well, I, I didn't, that isn't what they told us. So I would, uh, I'd like to keep my property a single family dwelling. I've lived there for almost 50 years. Okay. And I'd like to keep it like that. Any questions of Mr. Scaff? <laughs> okay, Mr. Scaff, I think we can easily accommodate your request. Pardon? I think we can easily accommodate your request. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you for coming forward. Thank you. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this issue? If not, I will call for the motion. Um, motion to approve item number 18. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item 18 passes. Item 19, 2009-04-04, a rezone from sub-area E of the Brady Estates Plan Development District to the C4 Plan Commercial District for allowed uses at southeast corner of South Southeastern and East 41st Street. Staff report. Thank you. The uh, applicant is Chuck Point with Ronnie Commercial. Uh, the Applicants requesting to the rezoning in order to allow general com commercial uses on the site. The site is essentially developed already, um, and as noted, it's at the corner of South Southeastern and East 41st Street. Actually, the, the street to the south is East Martian, East Marson Drive. Um, the area that's being that's under consideration is 4.7 acres in size, and would represent two lots. There's a existing gas station that I think actually has closed and um, the commercial strip center behind it. The Brady Estates Plan Development District was initially created in May of 1985 and a final development plan was approved for the construction of the convenience store and retail strip mall in September of 1994. The Plan Development District stipulates that the Planning Commission is to determine the number of businesses and square footage of buildings as, and as with all PDs required a final development plan for primary structures. The Planning Commission would no longer have this review oversight should the rezoning request be granted. Subary E of the Brady Estates PD allows permitted special uses listed under the C4 Plan Commercial District, but does not allow com conditional uses listed within that district. A rezone to conventional zoning district would allow those uses, allow those listed uses with Planning Commission approval of a conditional use permit. So you would have some oversight then. If, a, if it were a conditional use in the C4, it would have to come back to this body. 
The building locations are, uh, the two buildings have been constructed in this area, which is at the southwest corner of the property, which is the convenience store, and a retail strip center along the east side of the property, as we mentioned. Um, because the subject application reflects already developed uses and requires further review for specific additional uses, we are recommending approval of the rezoning. Um, we've received one phone call on this item, and it was a curiosity phone call, and uh, the caller expressed neither opposition nor approval. So that concludes staff report. Thank you, Dave. Any questions of Dave? Dave, did the city um, initiate this? Was it no. your idea to uh, do this? Or? No, this was initiated by Checkpoint. Any other questions? Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you Dave. You. Is the petitioner here? Of course he's here. <laughs> Thanks, I'm Chuck Point with Ronning Enterprises, in this case, Ronning Commercial. Um, let me just clarify that even though I'm the applicant of name, um, Ronnings are the applicant. I'm just their agent and employee. And even though I'd like to be able to think up these things to do on my own, I don't. So um, the convenience store and the strip center have been there for uh, a good long time. I think it's 12 or 14 years now. Uh, we aren't planning to do anything fancy or different. Um, uh, basically, um, the convenience store is kind of the driver in this. We've, uh, the convenience store was built um, to lease to uh, Midwest Oil about 12 or 14 years ago. Uh, and Midwest Oil operated it for, you know, 10 years or so. And then Walgreens came along and um, made them uh, hit a home run at 26th and Sycamore and bought their store there and they decided to basically retire. So they, they uh, uh, sold this store to um, um, another operator, or their, their interest in it. Uh, we still own the real estate. And that didn't work too good. Uh, and uh, then another operator came in about two years ago, and he tried very hard, but it was not successful in business. And he closed in late February. We have a new operator that will begin operation um, about the 8th of this month. And they are really nice people. I have learned more about the convenience store business in the last few months than I ever wanted to know and hope that I can forget very soon. Uh, but it's very interesting. The business has changed a lot in the last five years, if you've noticed around town. Convenience stores, when they get built now, are the size of what a grocery store was when I was young. And they have everything in them that a grocery store had in it when I was young. young. And they're very expensive and very big. And this store is not that. It is a small neighborhood convenience store and it has a hard time competing. Uh, but we have found a nice young couple who own one other convenience store in town and operate it successfully. And we are convinced that they can do that here. Uh, but people um, that aren't in our business don't understand exactly what and how a PD is. It's not confusing to you and I, we do it every day, uh, but it is confusing to other people. And so we uh, can talk to them a lot about it and then talk to our other friends and our consultants and our engineering firm and, and our friends at City Hall about what, what could we do. And um, the consensus was that the best thing to do is what was done with the single family area as it was built out. And the city came to us in that case, instead of us coming to them and said, We'd like to rezone the PD area of Brady Estates that is RS2 to just RS2. And we said, we don't care. Uh, that's fine. It's all built. And that's the case here. This is built. It's done. We aren't planning any big changes, don't have anything in mind. But the people that are going to lease with an option to purchase this store from us uh, would like to know exactly what they're able to do in the zoning. And this is the way we could most clearly explain it to them. And so that is our request. That's the reason for our request. And I'll certainly answer any of your questions that I can. Any questions of Chuck? Madam Chair, um, is, there a, is there a motivating change um, from the PD to the, to the commercial district that they're looking for? Signage um, change or is there something there that's... Yeah, I, I would say that um, 
I don't know if you've ever been to the store, uh, Commissioner, but it, um, we were convinced uh, by certain people to build it backwards on the lot when we built it. And so it, it is backwards on the lot. And, and most people that are in the convenience store business um, think that's not a very smart thing, quite honestly. And so they um, don't want to operate the store because they don't think that's smart. And it's very hard to pick up a building of that size and turn it around, even if you all would approve it. It's just very difficult. So the people that, that are going to operate it are fine. They, they, it sits backwards on the site, and it looks very nice. But they would like to be able to have signage that is allowed in C4 zone. That's so it's probably a signage-driven change. Yes. That is my guess. And they're considering a Dactronic sign. and, and uh, But most of the signage, uh, probably 90% of the signage would stay the very same. Uh, they're not considering a change to the canopy. The canopy, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. It doesn't have the big colors around it with neon or anything. It's just uh, brown uh, uh, sheet metal. And... Uh, and blends into the neighborhood, looks like the roof of a, of a house. And uh, the convenience store looks, you know, uh, very much like a house because it has a pitched roof and it's a very nice looking building. Okay, anyone else um, with questions for Chuck? Okay, thank you very much, Chuck. Anyone from the audience wishing to address item 19? If not, I will call for the motion. Can I ask uh, staff to sure. come up here? Yes. On the uh, sign issue, Dave, um, talking about the C4 sign, how would that well, how would that be different uh, from what's uh, allowed right now? Let me see if I can ask uh, Shauna here real quick. If she I don't want to say the wrong thing right off the bat here. So I think the signs, if I recall, pulling on my institutional memory for on the spot here, the signs that were approved with the final development plan, or the final development plan tied in the signs as approved by the Planning Commission at that time. So um, any additional, the sign allowance is similar to C4 now uh, anyway. Uh, but any additional signs that they would put out there under a PD uh, may, would have to maybe come back to you for approval or some kind of amendment process because it was, there was a specific condition of approval on that final development plan regarding signage and I can't cite it chapter and verse right now. Um, but the um, amount of signage that is allowed in this PD is the same allowance as what is currently allowed in the C4. It's the the sign right now is a as a uh, nice monument sign, mm -hmm. and I'd be concerned if it would uh, change. Uh, you want to speak to that? Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. You well, the um, the sign right now is a, a very nice monument sign right on Marson on on the southwest corner of the building there. Um, I just was trying to uh, figure out if they would, if this would get rezoned to C4, what kind of change in signage would you be looking for? You mentioned Dactronic sign. Um, nothing that isn't allowed under C4. And, you know, our view is that, um, again, when we were convinced um, by the Planning Commission and staff a number of years ago to build this building backwards on the site, we were wrong. We shouldn't have done it. But we did it. And now we can't pick the building up and turn it around. But the owner and the people that want to become the owner are asking for only the same things that every other owner of a C4 convenience store has in the city. That's all they're asking for. This C4 has an apartment not very far to the and, south of it. And, and we own it. Single family. And my mother lives in it. Right, and single family to the west, mm -hmm. across southeastern. Mm -hmm. So that's my concern. And we posted signs. Yeah. Chuck, I think you, you see our questions coming because this is, this is happening a little more regularly than we're used to. So I think we're trying to understand 
the motivation for coming out of a, of a PD into a different area. So The motivation, in my mind, is exactly the same as what the cities is when they, does, they do it. Right. It's, it's mm -hmm. done, and we're there, and we're not going to build another building. We're not going to tear that one down and build another one unless we can't lease it to somebody. Then we would. We'd have to. And all we're saying is it's zone C4 in the PD. We're just asking you, and we will ask the city council to rezone it to C4. I understand. Chuck, is there currently signage on the back of the building that faces um, There's that There's an oval city? sign. Mm -hmm. okay. says something like, right now it says something like BP or something like that. Okay. And that's not, no one's planning to change that. Mm -hmm. Except the, what it'll say, it'll say, sure. we believe now it'll say Clark rather than BP. Okay. But nobody's planning any changes. Are we planning changes? That's where they were looking at adding additional signage. Not now, they're not. Any other questions? Thank you, Chuck. Okay, we will call for the motion. I'll move to approve um, item 19 as presented. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? I think there should be a little discussion. I, I, I guess I hear staff say that the signage is the same under PD or close to as same as C4. But it brings up the question in my mind, why should you go from PD to C4 if the same business is going to be there that's there now? I mean, for some reason, I think in my mind, I feel this sign issue is going to create more signage for them. I think if we go C4, I think, <clears throat> I think we and staff lose control over what, uh, what signing might or might not go there. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm seeing it the wrong way or don't understand it completely. Do you have a question for Dave? Would you like him to come back up? Well, David, I, I, I think what I just heard is under PD, the sign allowance is the same as C4. Is that true? The sign allowance, yes. I don't, they did not have uh, a regulation within their PD that limited them to less signage than would normally be allowed in the C4 district. What I think was explained um, earlier, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember it right, um, she said that the signage that they have currently right now is was approved as part of the final development plan and to change any component of that would require an amendment process through this body and so um, it doesn't mean that they're that they're not allowed the signage they'd have to come back and ask you for it but uh, the, if if the rezoning was approved then they wouldn't come back to this body for it if we approve this to C4 will they be allowed more signage yes than what they have now how I much believe more? so I don't have that in front of me right now. I, um, it would be under the C4. Do you? Uh, I would you that. as staff lose control as to where the signing is going to go and well, where it's going to be placed? They, the, the current sign code uh, requires that the, the, their signs based upon the frontage and then the, or the length of the building. And so what, was, what is allowed along Southeastern Avenue is calculated based upon the Southeastern frontage. And so... Uh, that's that's how the calculation is done, and then um, I don't believe that there's a monument sign on on Marston, and and the applicant has indicated that that's not what he's looking for. So. You as staff aren't concerned about losing control. Well, we have a, signage in that particular neighborhood. We have a uh, precedent that we have that when when places are developed out, that we have asked that they be zoned to their conventional zoning district, and so. And the previous actions have have affirmed that that precedent, um, and so this case really isn't any different than any of the others that we've done in the past, uh, in our opinion. So uh, we don't see a reason. They haven't indicated that they're, you know, removing buffers or changing buildings or anything like that that they've constructed, and so we don't have a reason to to say that they can't do that when we've done that. Ken. I think, I mean, this is how my mind is moving through it, and since tonight's my last night, um, <laughs> nobody will care past tonight, but I'll tell you is that, you know, as each one of these comes 
forth. I mean, I agree with everything that Dave said. And unless we have a bunch of very concerned neighbors here um, who were, you know, when that PD was being developed and, and they're expressing an incredible amount of concern over the change, then I think we do have a precedent that says that that's protocol, that that's what we've done. Um, I've just been trying to understand, it, you know, it seems like we've had a few of these of recent and there may be a lot more coming as to what's kind of driving it, but I get the sense that it's pretty practical unless there's a bunch of neighbors here that are concerned. Uh, Anita, I'm a concerned neighbor. I know you are. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, and I'm down the road, too. I, I mean, I go by that development a lot. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that there was some sort of a public process, and um, we haven't called for audience yet. We'll see. Maybe there are people here that are. Yeah, we did. Oh, we did. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there was no one. Yes. Yeah. To address that. Yeah, you're right. We're on the motion. I haven't yeah. checked out totally yet, gang. I'll be here all night. But so I, you know, if, if we had a bunch of people here that were, you know, really concerned, then I would hesitate more. You know what, Ken, I appreciate your concern. And I do think each one of these needs to be looked at on an individual basis. You know, last month when we looked at this at the corner of 57th and Cliff, I thought it's a different neighborhood. Than, than where you're at right now, and um, I, I do understand your discomfort. It, um, I don't understand why it's just not easy to bring an amendment forward um, to get your signage changed. I, to me, I think that seems like a, a much simpler process, um, but for some reason we choose to do it differently, and and I think it, it then we don't know what we're getting, and I. Right, and I think the 57th and Cliff is is completely different where it's commercial on all, all four corners. Right. Here you have Marson, which is a, um, a very, it's a collector street, but it's very residential. Yeah. Within a half a block, you have uh, single family, and yeah. then across uh, southeastern to the west is uh, the backs of uh, single family as well. Dave, I do have another question for you. You talk about the signage being calculated based upon the frontage on Southeastern. Yeah. And I recognize, isn't this a bank here on the, the other building on the corner? The, uh, I'm sorry, which one were you? Um, the, the building behind the convenience store. It's a strip oh. mall. Okay. I think it's a strip mall. The angular building is a strip mall. I think there's two, there's two buildings that you're seeing that are on yeah. the convenience store corner, but that's actually the building and then the, the gas island canopy. Okay. 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 Any other questions? David, if if they wanted to change the signage under a PD, they could make a request, bring it to us. Mm -hmm. We yep. have a chance to see what they're talking about, what the sign's going to look like, yep. versus they have just the right to put up a certain amount of sign. Right. Right. They would they would have to do an amendment to their final development plan that was approved in 1994, I believe. So, and then that would have to be approved by this body. So. Thank you, Dave. Yep. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the table. Uh, does anyone have any other questions before we move forward? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Okay, we need a show of hands. All in favor? One, two. Opposed? Well, at least I don't have to break a tie this time. <laughs> um, motion denied. Okay, number 20. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, re amending the revised ordinances of the city by adding language to rezoning application requirements. Staff report. Good evening. Again, thank you. Um, like, it, like was just stated, this is an amendment to the zoning ordinance to add language requiring notification of property owners specific to rezoning applications. Um, this ordinance amendment will help define an applicant's responsibility when applying for a change of zoning on any given property. The amendment requires that an applicant notify all affected property owners and provide evidence of that not notification at the time of application. This amendment is specifically targeted to the properties being rezoned and notification of surrounding properties is not required before applying 
To address surrounding property owners, the applicants will still be required to post signs on the property boundaries one week before a public hearing date, and in many cases, a neighborhood meeting would be strongly recommended. On February 23rd, planning staff met with members of the City Council's Land Use Subcommittee and presented a proposal for a zoning ordinance amendment as related to the required notification of property owners affected by a rezoning application. The Land Use Subcommittee requested that staff move forward to the Planning Commission for its recommendation of a zoning ordinance amendment uh, and, and then forward to the City Council. Additional comments were received from members of the Planning Commission and the general public and have been incorporated into the ordinance as presented in your packets. Uh, because the subject application clarifies the proposed, proposed and intent, proposal and intent of the requirements for applying for a zoning change and requires property owner notification of applications for zoning changes, staff, we are recommending approval of the zoning ordinance amendment. And you may have seen some of the discussion or been a party of some of the discussion prior to this. Uh, I, I want to read some of the changes in the actual zoning ordinance amendment that uh, we're looking at here. The, the most significant alteration, I think, is that is an addition of a paragraph that says the applicant shall ensure that property owners within the area desiring a zoning change have been notified. Notification in, may include signatures on the application or letters sent to the owners. The applicant shall provide evidence of, that notifica of such notification at the time of application. So basically what that means is when somebody's applying for a zoning ordinance change or a zoning change, that upon their application that they have to provide either the signature on the application of the property owner or some sort of evidence that they've sent a letter to the, to the property owner that's being, that's being, whose property is being rezoned. Uh, so I can answer any additional questions that you have, but uh, at this time that concludes staff report. Thank you, Dave. Any questions for Dave? Thank you. Okay, and since he is also the petitioner, <laughs> um, anyone else in the audience wishing to address this? Okay, call for the motion. Madam Chair, I'll motion to Approve item number 20, a rezoning of the ordinance procedure. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, if not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion number, er, number 20 passes. Number 21. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls amending the revised ordinances of the city by revising location of accessory buildings. Shauna. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Shauna Goldammer, and I am your Zoning Enforcement Manager. Yes, Tonight we have a city-initiated uh, request from the zoning staff, primarily a housekeeping measure that clarifies where the location of accessory detached-type buildings can go, a detached garage. Versus, uh, or versus an attached garage. Um, there's actually kind of four parts to this. First, that if an accessory building is closer than 10 feet, it counts with the same setbacks as the main building. Now that kind of comes out of the building code because if it's closer than 10 feet, then there's firewall separations and that kind of thing. The second provision is that uh, set the accessory build, if the accessory building is detached, then it can, go, it can go in the rear yard closer to the property lines than if it was an attached garage. Also, uh, that this regulation only applies to buildings, not structures. In our ordinance, the way we define a structure would also include a fence. And so we want to make clarify that this location of an accessory, not structure, but building. And, and lastly, the fourth provision is a 30% rule. We have a rule in the zoning ordinance that speaks to the location of accessory buildings. Think of a detached garage. It can't take up more than 30% of your rear yard. This clarifies that that provision only applies to detached structures. Attached structures, again, would have to uh, have the same setback as a main building. And so, because it is for just clarification, uh, staff is recommending that you approve this zoning ordinance amendment. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. 
Sean, Any questions? Were, was your department having some issues with this uh, as far as new construction, garages, storage buildings, such like that? Correct, yes. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of Shauna? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shauna. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this item? Okay, if not, we'll call for the motion. I'll move for approval of item 21. I'll, I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Number 21 passes. Number 22, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls amending the revised ordinances of the city for campgrounds and travel trailers. Shauna? Thank you. Again, Shauna Goldammer, Zoning Enforcement Manager. Uh, I want to start out by giving you a brief history regarding both travel trailers and campgrounds. The travel, history, travel trailer history, thank you, uh, can be traced back to the 1930s. Back then, a trailer camp was someplace that trailers parked around one main building. The duration of these camps was most often only a few days. As time progressed, travel trailers became more like houses and the term trailer house became common. In the 1950s and 60s, there was a split between two very different industries, that of the recreation vehicle, RVs, and that of the mobile home or manufactured home industry. For manufactured home industry, the term trailer parks emerged. Trailer parks are often longer stays for units that are towed onto the site. This ordinance does not include changes to existing manufactured home ordinance. The licensed manufactured home park ordinance is outside the scope of this proposal. What we are proposing is a definition change to campground, which has not changed since 1970. Campgrounds are allowed in C2, C4, and the agricultural district in Sioux Falls. As a land use, campgrounds fall under a commercial category. This com commercial land use is intended to provide as an accommodation to transient guests in that transient that they move around a lot. And uh, staff has discussed this ordinance with campground owners. Now we do have three privately owned campgrounds within the city limits. Comments have been received and have resulted in a number of revisions from the first time that we brought this forward back in March. Additional sections and proposed revisions are discussed in your staff report. The points of discussion continue to be the time period in which constitutes a temporary stay. However, based on concerns of the stakeholders, the proposal and components of the ordinance have been modified. Primarily, these discussions surrounded around dwelling units and illegal camping, which has resulted in removal of these sections from the proposed ordinance. The final draft before you here this evening focuses on campgrounds and those provisions are accommodations to camping units. The majority of changes are in the final proposal, and I just want to go through some slides here with you uh, to show you some, some different campgrounds and uh, different amenities. Now, when, you, when I say campground, this is probably what you would expect. Um, a nice looking campground, it's clean, campers are in order, um, and it's, it's a nice looking place. It's some place that you would, when you say campground, this is in its mar it, this, these were taken in April, so in South Dakota, campgrounds are, you know, kind, not too populated, but uh, this is a this is very nice campground within the city limits of Sioux Falls. Um, this might be also something that you would expect to see at a campground, some campers lined up um, with some maybe lawn furniture outside. However, um, I would venture to guess that something like this would not be something that you would expect to see a campground where uh, additions are provided and uh, stakes are put into the ground for campgrounds. 
So with the provisions of this ordinance would uh, not allow uh, additions to be placed within campsites like what you've seen here. They would allow uh, campers to prov be provided accommodation for 180 days and after 180 days they would have to be removed. Also the provisions of the ordinance in this revisions provide for uh, electrical hookup standards that are uh, required in the inter International Building Code for RV parks. So in section one of the ordinance, changes uh, to the definition of camping, where camping units can be parked. This section defines campgrounds as parking areas to be utilized as accommodations rather than a place of residence. Section two adds language recommended by the stakeholders. Travel trailers and camping units are synonymous under this definition. Staff notes that stakeholders would prefer that uh, the word camping unit come before the word travel trailer. Um, and for codification reasons, staff is recommending the final version that is before you. Section three changes the conditional use standards for a campground. Any new campgrounds that would come in and request a conditional use permit or those that you would choose to review under a revocation process would need to follow these new standards that are in the proposal. Changes include a minimum lot size, or excuse me, the minimum lot size has remained unchanged. That's 2,000 square feet or of a campsite, a camp lot. Under the new conditional sta use standards, campsites would need to be identified with a number or a letter. Additionally, campsites under this proposal specifies that a construction of decks, carports, unenclosed canopies, or enclosed vestibules are not allowed. Again, we're talking within the campsite. There is a clarification that the water supply has to be potable water, and this was at a recommendation of stakeholders. Additional standards for electrical and plumbing are also recommended. Reduced setbacks are proposed at the recommendation of the stakeholders. A new standard for campgrounds that require LP tanks to be only those provided by the camping units manufacturer. At the uh, recommendation of a stakeholder, the conditional use standards that reiterates that campground compliance with zoning regulations and up other applicable uh, other applicable ordinances is being stricken and also at the recommendation of the stakeholders the requirement for record keeping is also being stricken from from the ordinance or the conditional use standards uh, because the intent of the zoning ordinance is to carry out the goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan and to promote health and welfare of the community staff is recommending approval of the ordinance amendment and I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Any questions of Shauna? Madam uh, Chair? Yes. Just uh, a clarification. Um, the uh, Planning Commission got a letter on May 4th, and I just wanted to know if, if this is true and you agree with this. It says, upon re reviewing the existing ordinance, both staff and I agree that its contents is inappropriate. Is that I you, guess, I mean, I, I guess. I, I, could you rephrase your question? I, I have read the letter. I'm not, this is the proposal that I am recommending yeah. approval on. I'm just wondering, you would certainly not agree with that. That I, that it's, could you read it again? Its contents are inappropriate. The contents are inappropriate. Talking about the uh, ordinance. This proposed Right, it's proposal. your, right, yeah. No, okay. I just would not say that they're inappropriate. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, um, the photos that were taken, those were taken in Sioux Falls? On, Correct. In campsites in Sioux Falls? Yes. And some are old. Um, they they're, um, were taken uh, in uh, November and May of last year. Um, so they don't, they don't all reflect current conditions. Some were taken just recently in April of 2009. But a lot of the um, ones that are not typical what you would see in a campground were taken uh, in November of 2008. This was brought to your attention through citizen, through observation, uh, through? Uh, yes, a code enforcement action. A code enforcement action, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, Shana, 
Did I see some mobile homes in some of those pictures along with campers? Now, if I owned a mobile home park, could I allow camping in a mobile home park, or would that fall under some different rules? Uh, what's allowed in a, manu a licensed manufactured home park is a manufactured home. Now, the difference is, like I tried to explain, it was there was a split in the industry, and it has to do with safety standards for housing that is put together by HUD, and those, they're uh, federal standards, and um, mo mobile homes or manufactured homes have a, a certification that they have been inspected when they roll off the assembly line uh, regarding those safety standards. So manufactured homes are allowed in manufactured home parks. Although there are some manufactured home parks in the city of Sioux Falls that are, um, that are in their legal non-conforming uses, <coughs> so they would be allowed to have campers in those particular uh, uh, licensed manufactured home parks. So. Uh, since this issue has come up, I've, I've paid a little more attention to some of the campgrounds. What I seem to notice is come November, it appears to me that some people, rather than renting a garage and storing their motorhome, might go out to a campground, rent the spot, and leave it sit there all winter. Mm -hmm. Is that totally, that is allowed uh, as far as this ordinance would be concerned? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> 180 okay. days. Right. right. Pardon? 180 days. Right. Okay, thank you. Shaw, with regard to striking the requirement that operators keep records, mm -hmm. so that would just be up to your department it's only to enforce that? Right, we, and, and we enforce the zoning ordinance on a complaint basis, and so if a complaint came in, um, we would make a note of, you know, what was there, and then 180 days go back out and, and see if it's moved around or not. So if you didn't get a complaint until the end of the 180 days, they could be there for quite a while. Right. I mean, the clock would start ticking once we become okay. aware that they may, may be a possible violation. Shauna, I uh, went and observed some of these campgrounds as well prior to our March meeting, and I have to say, um, I too was quite surprised at um, the amount of electrical cords that are strung from unit to unit and unit to electrical box. And really my greatest concern was these um, propane tanks that are not secured to anything and they um, are sizable and, um, and we have pop-outs with insulation stuck in them and I, I, I'm really concerned that based on the climate that we live in and um, just how cold it can get in the winter, that there are some life safety issues around some of these units that appear to have some permanent installations around them. So um, I would agree. I, I think there, there just needs to be some clarification in the ordinance as, as to what's allowed and what's not allowed. And we certainly want to encourage people to come and camp in South Dakota, winter and summer, if that's what you like. But um, can't build any permanent structures onto your camper. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all your hard work, Shauna. Just one other thing, if I can, Pam. Sure. Just to reiterate, we talked about it in March, but it's 180 days in the spot, and on the 181st day, you can back out and go to the spot next year if you so desire. Correct. And your 180 starts again. Yes. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this issue? My name is Steve Craig, uh, Westwick Motel, 5801 West 12th Street. I guess I'm probably the problem that started this. Uh, we was uh, notified that we was in some violations, and we was taking care of this. I thought we was going about things properly, um, leastways we wasn't uh, slapped with any fines or anything. A lot of them, their pictures that show a lot of electric cords and that, their conduit that was uh, for cable TV, which would be buried this year in the spring when it thawed out and stuff. Um, the camping industry has changed quite a bit. Uh, you've got uh, RV units 
that are like uh, efficiency apartments, you might say. You're ruling on different things the way to make things work out in a small business. The way they was at first when I first come in here uh, in February uh, was 30 days and then they had to move out, couldn't be there for the rest of the year. And this would make a difference of about a quarter of my income, which was not feasible. So at that point, we decided to let the property go back to the previous owner. So that's fine, but your decision making for people that live and own these RVs, you're dealing with some very uh, delicate things. So I wish you'd keep this in mind when you make some of the decisions on the rulings. And I'm sure there'll be other people who'll talk about some of that. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Craig? Anyone else wishing to address this item? Dwayne, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Frank Cole. Dwayne Spader, 5417 North Indiana. Uh, we can probably distribute this. You'll see why I didn't want to include that in the packet, and I'm going to ask that that be tore up or given back to me when I'm done, when I'll show you why. To be honest, I don't know where to start. I want to keep it as short as possible. Uh, I got much to say, and I'm not going to say it with it, but I am going to say some things that need to be said and directly involve me, but that's not as much of an issue as some of the other things that need to be said. Let me first make some comments about my citizenship, and I don't like to talk about myself. Most people don't even have any idea who I am or what I do. My work, my lifetime work, has been organizational deficiencies and things that damage organizations. I have two international corporations that I've consulted with that were both, the CEO will both claim that we turned them around. I've spoken at international board of directors meetings. Now, I'm not here to be boisterous, but I understand what I'm saying when I'm doing it here. I also work with thousands of small businesses. And you saw before you a gentleman that was in my office about a week after the last, and I had never met him before that. Uh, when I opposed this at that other thing, that wasn't it. And what I saw there was he and his wife, a beaten man, says, we aren't going to be able to make it. They're shutting us down. Why are they shutting us down? Does someone want to own our property or what? I think that's a legitimate question. And I, I related to him because 10 years prior to that, I went home from ordinance meetings or ordinance fighting for my life in a certain business made a telephone call, and sold the company. Fortunately, I was able to sell the company. They flew in, and that company is now owned by ADP, which got the big thing of here. I, have, I still kept it in Sioux Falls. Had it been what I'm going to talk about tonight, the one-liners that would be in Sioux Falls, and it would be between 150 and 250 professional people paid, would still be bringing hundreds and thousands of additional people just from that company. As a citizen of Sioux Falls, and I don't like saying this, but I, I want to set the stage. As a citizen of Sioux Falls, I question if there's many other businesses that bring more thousands of people to Sioux Falls than ourselves, and we aren't searching for glory, and most people don't even know it, if you want to check it out. Now, what I'm going to say is both personal, and it does affect me, the effects of ordinances and the damage that is done and denied, and everybody is scared to talk about it. You saw this gentleman. When he and his wife were sitting in my office, I just saw what was going through, the expression on his face, a beaten man and his wife who just lost their lifetime savings. 
and there was no excuse for it. So I went and, and checked on it. And that, I talked about my previous experience on one of my businesses. I've seen hundreds and hundreds. I've, I've been in meetings with a thousand businesses where growing men break down and cry in tears because of the unjust that's being done to them. Uh, and I'm going to try to demonstrate that night, that tonight. Look at my KOA financials. Those financials, by the way, I apologize for not typing them up, but I print them, I just asked my accountant to give them to me. I didn't want to be biased, I didn't maneuver them. This is the way she printed them out. Now we've owned that campground since 1973. It has never lost any money. We've never made a lot of money, but we've never lost it. Starting in 2006, look what happened. And those are all direct effects of what is taking place here tonight and what other people are. And you can see the main culprit is the tremendous costs that have been added. And not one single benefit has benefited the campground from those costs. And those costs were, were a effect of planning and zoning using what I call one-liners. My main opposition to the last time I was here, that I was just focusing on one sentence. Everybody else was focusing on everything else. Now, I can go on and on about that, but do I have a stake there? Who's going to subsidize that losses in this campground for the next number of years? Besides that, I had to spend an extra $300,000 which increased the cost when Robo Drive was put in because of dumb, stupid regulations based upon one-liners. And I'll go into as much detail as you want, but I recommend we not do it tonight. So do I have a right to stand and say this? Look at the numbers. Does the city want to subsidize me? They are not lowering my taxes. Do they want to subsidize me for those losses? I went to the city council and paid it with them to prevent some of this. Now, folks, let me stop there. My wife told me I had to be good tonight. Uh, uh, Mr. Spader, I, I just would like to... I, I would let like me get to, to the facts. I'd like to remind you that we do have a five-minute limit. That's not fair, then. If, if, well, if, if you want to kick me out, then kick me out. No, but. we're not going to kick you out, and we certainly, you know, we certainly want to give you due process, and I will okay. allow another four minutes. But oh, that's not fair, so let me quickly go over. Have you looked at mine? Yes. I sent you one, and by the way, I was the one that put that, we did agree upon that the old zoning was inappropriate. You aren't going to give me time to go over why. We did agree that the present owning was non-functional and nor realistic. It was an addressed ordinance to the, it did not address the present needs, and I agreed with that, and Jeffrey Smith also said that. We agreed to agree upon that. And I stated in the previous letter that the the staff uh, was defending the ordinance and was going to close down a campground, which they did. Now, what I did is I went through the existing ordinance and I simply removed things that were inappropriate, industry-wise, uh, they were in a, totally inappropriate. I added the phrase publicly owned or privately owned campground. I think there is a difference. You can see through what was underlined, why I added, I cleared up some terminology that explains why I did. And on this, uh, section three, I added that phrase to pertain only to new campgrounds built after 2008 within city limits. And next, and next campgrounds need not comply. And I went through those because many of them are campground will not comply. And most of them would not. The 2,000 square foot. I don't want to even go measure some of mine because it's not going to apply. Uh, the frontage, the, the, the backside, the roads, the road widths and that. And I think they're even more exorbitant than KOAs, exorbitant. And then the, the bottom four, and you just look at the bottom one and see how out of date it was. All campground operators shall keep accurate records as to the length of time a person stays in the campground and shall make said records available to any city official upon request. Now, folks, I'm asking this because this will make this ordinance. Every campground in the city will qualify for it under with these few minor changes uh, with it. And as far as to the city proposed campground, 
What they are proposing, I'm not going to give them the time to go through, but I'll quickly cover what it is. Uh, first off, I think it should automatically be disqualified because if it's as common in many of my practices with staff, it's missing a key component. They decide to drop it out of there. It's not showing that it's dropped out. Can they do that? Can staff just do that anytime they want? Drop it out? And that's at Section 235, if you look in mind. That was in the ordinance I was given. Uh, it's still terribly drafted. The one phrase in there that gives them Carter Blanche endorsement for everything is, is in there. That Section 235 is dropped out. Uh, now, why, why am I so struggling about one-liners? You people got to be aware that when you pass an ordinance, it gives them absolute authority over you. They have no accountability. They are spending someone else's money. Uh, and if you challenge them, the Gestapo effect, and I've said this before the city council, the Gestapo effect is alive in town. So we as small business people doing it, and I'm just trying to eliminate these. And there are, this is full of one-liners. And I spent four years studying their processes, and I'll gladly share them with you sometime on, on the methodologies they use and, and the whole methodology of zoning. I am asking that you not, you not, because of several one-liners, it's going to be a major problem for existing campgrounds. They just got authority with, with no accountability, uh, and they will exercise it at will. The pretext of safety and health issues. Now, I think that's legitimate. I felt so legitimate, so I called staff and I says, okay, give me a list of the incidents that create you forcing this. Well, we don't have any, but this could happen, that could happen. I mean, and, and real honest, staff gave me some bogus things that were just, that's the reason you're demanding that we lose the profitability of our campground or you're shutting us down. Give me some specific interest. And I was told I would get that, and I did not get it uh, with it. Okay, so, what I would like to do now, Mr. Spader, is give the rest of the Planning Commission an opportunity to ask you some detailed questions about some of these issues. So I'm at this point going to um, open it up to the rest of the Planning Commission so they can ask you their <laughs> questions. Dwayne, um, what I think I hear you saying is that if you set aside the 180-day issue and you set aside um, the life safety conversation about how we feel about trying to prevent an incident of danger to someone who's doing something that we think is wrong. Are you saying that there are things within this ordinance that you cannot comply with without making major changes to your operation, i.e., you said the 2,000-square-foot campground? Are there things within this ordinance that you would have to invest substantial dollars to come into compliance with this ordinance. Now, you're talking about the one I'm proposing or the one the, the one that the proposed? staff proposed? Yes, it's all kinds of things that are detrimental. The first is that phrase that I, that I brought up at the first meeting. I just focused on that. It was the only phrase I focused on. An accommodation away from the place of residence of occupants and not constituting a principal place of residence of the occupant. That's a loaded one-liner that they can interpret anyway, and 20 to 30% of our campers that is their full-time residence. So, Mr. Spader, they park their camper at your campground permanently, forever. So they pull into your campground and they park it and they, they, they stay there. They're permanent residents in your campground. What's wrong with that? I'm asking the question. I don't, I'm not saying there is anything the matter okay. with it. I'm just asking the question. There's two types of campers the industry is involved in. You've got the overnighters and you have the seasonals. Mm -hmm. The seasonals buy RVs, bring them into the camp, park them there, and the only time they're moved is when they usually trade them in for another one. The only time, and yes, those people want cabanas, they want decks on them uh, because they're there, they come and go as they please uh, with it. Some, some may stay longer. And yeah, the 180 day, I'm totally opposed to. It's going to eliminate the future of my campground for any seasonals. Uh, 
But I think, Dwayne, I could be I could be wrong about this, but I've been I, I know what you're talking about. I've seen some of these in, in other locations where you go in, you actually buy a plot of land, you build it out, you build your deck, your cabana, but you pay property taxes on that, and that's actually land that you improve, and it's real estate as opposed to a that's campground a, that's owned by someone and is renting spots. That's a condominium campground where they actually buy the lot and pay taxes on it. A normal 90% of all campgrounds have seasonals and they bring the RV in and leave it parked. That's part of it. And it is the safety I have to hopefully recover some of this in the future that if gas goes to $6, you can better believe I'm going to put seasonals up in my campground. Uh, and you I need kinda, to have that option. You would convert potentially to a property tax paying, sell a plot well, of land, Well, let first off, the campground there. is paying the property taxes. They're paying the sales taxes on the monthly things, rent that they have. No, now, uh, Anita, you mentioned that once to me. If the property tax is an issue, then let's make that a separate issue. Let's not burden a whole campground because of property, of that one little issue, which is one fraction of 1% of, of RVers in the United States. But Mr. Using, Sayer, I, I went to your campground, and I didn't see any of the campers in your campground currently that had a deck on them or a cabana or an existing structure built onto it. So you say you ha you have these, but I, I don't see them I, I'm there. I'm saying that if gas goes to $6 an hour, dollars an hour, and I, we have requests for it, but because I'm limited on space and don't have enough sites now, we've chosen not to allow the seasonals. Although we have some seasonals that will be in there from, uh, they're in the now and they'll probably stay until we close. And some of them asked to stay all winter. We've chosen not to do that. But they will be there from now until they close and they're right down in the F, right along the highway. We've only got four spots and we literally turn away lots of people that request to stay longer. Uh, but we've chosen to keep our campground an overnighter, mostly because it's KOA. And KOA helps bring the overnighters in. Without that, if it wasn't KOA, I, the campground just couldn't make Well, you can see. Just look at the numbers. Uh, the campground's not going to survive. Yes, and these, these implications are wiping out my potential for seasonal campgrounds. Mr. Spader, all they have to do then is after the 180 days is pick up and move to another spot. And if they don't have these, um, anything that's structurally built onto it, that shouldn't be an issue. <laughs> Ma'am, if, if I may say this, uh, it'd be okay if you bought it there for, if I told you you had to come out after 180 days and, and keep it. But more important, this is a private campground. What does it matter? I would agree if it's a public campground and it's in your charge. This is a private campground. I pay the taxes. Uh, we pay all the taxes. What right do you have or wh what is wrong with people staying there longer? And yes, they're not going to. I can tell you this, my work campers are going to have to move this sometime in the summer. Uh, but, but that's no different than homeowners having to abide by city ordinances. You know, we all have things that we have to live with that we may or may not like. Well, I, I, I think I know I'm beat. I'm, this will be the third business and the ordinance will wipe me out, and that's okay, and that's a fact. Uh, if you want, do not want me, on my next request then, because I can see I'm not going to go anywhere with this, uh, with it, my next request is, is when I come back and ask that we be, with, be withdrawn from city limits, I hope that you will honor that request, and I'll be out of your hair. I'll be out of everybody's hair, just to be out of city limits. Well, I was just trying to ask the questions yeah. to see how this would negatively It will affect, affect me. It will it'll affect us negative. The seasonal campers that want to come in and stay there and buy you, and, and the only time they're going to move it is when they're going to trade. They are going to want their decks. Their, what is the definition of accessories by theirs? Accessories for a seasonal camper is decks. It is platforms. It is that that they can come out there. And we're just saying uh, they don't even understand the terminology between. Uh, I, Dwayne, this. I'm trying. I'm trying to, you know, kind of separate some of this because I I think that most of us up here are business people and we we do understand what you're trying to say. I mean, I hear you when I hear you say that there's modifications that you will have to. I'm trying to understand what those are because, for 
for me, and we may disagree philosophically on this a little bit, but I, I do feel like a campground should have some time around it so that it doesn't become a permanent place of stay. And I do think that there are life safety things that we have to kind of keep in check. But I don't, um, as a business person, want to bear you with additional costs if there are things in here that are modifications that you have to make. So that's why I'm trying to discover what about this. I mean, there's philosophical disagreements on, you know, okay, first off, propane what, takes and stuff like that. What life safety issues have been documented or happened? We've been, all of the campgrounds have been open for 30 or 40 years. Give us a recommendation. What, what life safety issues have happened in campgrounds that would cause you to destroy us? And you know, I Dwayne, we, we, do, I, we I, do things all the time that are preventative, that are preventative so that we don't have to have the big um, blow up and then we try to make rules so that it doesn't happen again. I mean, that, that's probably just a disagreement that we're going to have. There's a lot of things that I don't like that are preventative, like wearing my seatbelt and all those kinds. Of, I'm kind of that person too, but I'm, I'm trying to understand if you're going to have to pull out a check blank tomorrow to accommodate into some of these things, that to me are, is different than something that we're asking because we think it's reasonable. And it sounds, and I didn't hear until tonight that you said that there were things in here that you were going to have to invest more money in your campground into. <coughs> and that's, that's what I'm trying to discover. Because that's, I don't think, the intent. Do you want me to answer that question the way I should answer it? <laughs> That's up to you. I... Let me answer it, because I, I, I've seen too much of this, folks. I'm sorry, but I, I've seen so many lives, so many businesses destroyed by this. First off, that cost of the campground is the result of two single one-liners that was totally the interpretation, and, and one of them overrode things. So zoning comes in, and I challenge them. Now, me standing up here and challenging it, I can tell you, folks, there's nothing I can do in the city. The Gestapo effect is alive. Now, you don't want to hear that. It is alive. It has been exercised against me, and I've, I've Mr. not... Mr. Speeder, uh, what I would ask you to do is just please directly answer Anita's question if, if you'd like. I asked her if she wanted it the way it was answered. Yes, well, there are one-liners in there that when they choose to, at the time they choose, they will come in and they'll nail me and they'll do it and they're the thing I do. I can't come here, I can't go to the city council, I can't go to the state's attorney, I've gone all the way to the attorney general, but it's up to, yes. And, and did you, so, I mean, because to me, lost revenue is one thing. Like, I might have a couple people have to leave because of this 180 day and I, lost revenue is one thing and investment in your existing property is another. Did you and Shauna discuss the things that were in here that you felt like you were going to have to bring your campground up to conformance or something that was going to be like write a check. They knew that I objected to every one of these proposals and Shauna and Jeffrey, I sat in their office and told them why and, and the reasons they gave me I felt were bogus reasons for this safe thing and, and I challenged them on the health safety issue. That's when I says, okay, show me the facts, show me all the safety. They did not give me one single one and so they're coming in on the presumption uh, presumptions that have no references, no basics, and I think that's one question you should ask everyone. Ms. Dunlap, the question you asked, I think whether one asks, have you had a problem, I think you should ask, how many problems have you had? Because one incident gives him the authority to have absolute dictatorial authority that's costing business unbelievable dollars. Now, this was stated to you at my last meeting so diligently, much more diplomatically, much more diligently by Kermit Staggers when he forewarned you about the ordinance they were working on and somebody's going to pay the cost. See, when you can make decisions for other people like you people do, and you don't have to be responsible and you don't have to pay for it, it's easy to make the decision. Oh, Mr. Speeder, uh, I, I, would, I would totally disagree with you on that because we all are citizens of this city and there are decisions that are made every day that affect all of our lives. That, that's not the issue right now. And I'm going to give, um, see if any of the other planning commissioners have any other questions of you and then we're going to... Um, 
we're going to uh, discontinue public testimony. I, I am going to ask one more question, and um, I'm going to ask a question of Sean as well. And I understand there may be other people there that may be other people that want yeah, to speak. So be, yeah. before you cut off public testimony, okay. I'd like to hear from them. Um, okay. Okay. And, yes. and Dwayne, you may yes. want to answer some of this as well. So, Shauna, mm -hmm. I heard Dwayne say that he doesn't want to measure the square feet of his camping plots, and these setbacks are. He also mentioned that as maybe an issue of concern. Those are existing items in our existing ordinance that have not changed. Okay, let's let's take a look at his. If you have I'm Mr. Spader's at propo proposal and, and and mine. Okay, mm -hmm. um, you'll notice that in section one he uh, is indicating that he wants to add privately owned or publicly owned, um, which I did not include in mine because that goes it's redundant. I didn't feel that I should put that in there because a campground it doesn't matter ownership. We don't talk about ownership; it's the land use. So public, private, yes, mm -hmm. both. It applies to both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he uh, is recommending that we strike occupied as a temporary living quarters. I've added language that says that it's an accommodation away from your residence. Um, so that's where the big difference is in the campground ordinance between what he is proposing and what I'm proposing. Um, the dwelling unit discussion, and he alluded to uh, definition 235, that's been totally taken out of my proposal, and it stays the way it is in the current ordinance. We're not talking, 235, by the way, is the definition of a dwelling unit. And as I indicated, we're not talking about dwelling units anymore. We're talking about campgrounds. Sean, I need to go back just real quickly okay. to the um, separate from your original residence statement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I understand what Dwayne is saying there. There's people that sell their houses and they travel around the country and they either rent a P.O. box in a state that's tax significantly friendly to them and that's what they do. Okay. But this is not us trying to make them prove they have another permanent living space someplace else. No. That's wordsmithing to me. And, I, um, and I'm just wondering if, if that's what's causing that concern because there are people that... RVers. RVers. Yes. With a P.O. box, usually yes. in South Dakota, because yes. it's friendly. Yes, and, and in yeah. this definition, you, what the big the big thing is both his proposal and the current ordinance speaks to a plot of ground. So not a in a camping area. In, okay. Not a person. Okay. In an RV. All right. It's about the plot of ground. Okay. Um, camping unit. The the recommendation he has always said that he's opposed to adding what a definition of temporary means. We've um, chosen to go with some, uh, temporary means less than 180 days. And um, then in the conditional use standards for campgrounds, uh, conditional use permit standards are what we use when a conditional use permit is requested. So if a conditional use permit was requested and this ordinance passes, then these are the standards they'd have to live with. When we change conditional use standards, we don't go back to all the conditional use permits that we've, that we've already issued um, and make everybody comply with the new standards. So, so is there language to that effect in this ordinance? In my proposal, no, there is not. Should there be language uh, it, it, to that effect? You certainly can do an amendment if you'd like. But Shauna, that's not standard in any other ordinances. No, it's that not. That. No. And, and when you look at this ordinance, it was in 1970, so we're talking 39 years ago. Um, and in good standard form, most businesses, public entities, revise their ordinances and relook at them on a timely basis, correct? Correct, yes. And so this isn't, um, we didn't do this to close businesses down. It's just making sure our ordinances are up to date. Correct. And they meet current standards. Because we know in 39 years, things change a lot. Yes, I'd agree with that. And then the other provisions, uh, deleting the 30-day rule, we've done that. Mm -hmm. um, deleting G, which is 
just a reserved um, section. We've done that. Delete H, uh, which is the provision for uh, that you have to meet current code. The recommendation is to delete that. We did that. Um, the last section to delete all campground operators keep records, our proposal, we delete that too. So, I mean, I think, I, I think we're pretty close. The sticking point is 180 days, which I have said we can agree to disagree. Also, I have provisions that I, I truly believe are life sta safety standards for things like water and sewer connections, propane tanks, and uh, especially electrical. And um, those things are proposed to, to remain in there. So, Shauna, what you know about the existing campgrounds, will they all need to make infrastructure changes to come up to that code compliance? On uh, the life only if piece? we, uh, if they want to do an expansion of their existing campground, which one of the campground owners did talk to us about doing an expansion, and, and then they would have to um, meet with this current code once it's effective. Uh, if the other ones would only have to meet these standards in the situation where they would request a new conditional use permit or by chance a revocation process would begin and we revoke the other one and make them get a new one, that's a possibility too. I mean, revocation of uh, conditional use permits doesn't happen very often, but the ordinance does give us the authority to take a look at those if they aren't meeting conditions that were placed on them. I would just like to make one comment about the about the um, um, the revisions that may have to be made, if, or the the uh, compliance that may that they may have to uh, do if they do an expansion or whatever. You know, it's the same in my world when you're if you if you are expanding or remodeling in an office building and it's not completely ADA compliant. Once you start to remodel or change things, then that comes into play. So it's not just the campgrounds that we're focusing on, those kinds of restrictions um, are in many other aspects of our business life. So. I guess one other comment I would have too is that this whole thing is about a campground which is intended to be a temporary place to park and if you're talking about people being there all year then you're talking about making it into a trailer park or something yeah, else. Yeah, and so. I, I'm not sure what that is. I mean, if we want to have a separate study group to, to figure that out, I'm happy to do that, but that is not within this proposal or the scope of this ordinance. Okay, any other questions of Shauna? Shauna, just one quick one. If, mm -hmm. if any of these camp owners decided to do this hybrid, I think Dwayne called it a condominium campground mm -hmm. scenario, it, is that currently covered anywhere in our Currently, no. So that would be sort of a new thing we would have to step out and look at. Right. Yep. And we can certainly do something like that within the scope of Shape Sioux Falls. I mean, it gives us the ability to look at things and be flexible and providing, you know, a different kind of accommodation, a resort-like place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shauna. Anyone else from the audience wishing to address this? And I will, I, I will um, just remind you that we need to hear new and other pertinent testimony. I will be much shorter. David Fritz, uh, I just received the Westwick Motel back again from Steve. I wanted to say to the community here and Shauna, be very cautious. Uh, such as residents away from home. Uh, we are looking at the camping industry as it was 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, they're coming out with monsters for campers. Million and a half dollar RVs. These are people's homes. Uh, and they're coming out with what's called a Four Seasons. That means you can live in them year round in South Dakota. Uh, so that 180 days, I really, I think you should look at that close, 180 days, it's not unreasonable for them to live here in the wintertime in these camp, campers they're building now. Not unusual at all. They've got heated underbellies, if that's what they call them. It's heated so you can stay the winter and your water lines don't freeze up. 
another thing uh, I'd like to caution on, the, the LP tanks. No LP tanks other than those supplied by the manufacturer. Well, those change. Uh, if you've got an uh, RV that's 20 years old, those tanks have been gone and changed already because nobody will fill them. That, I would think, should be more under the ruling of the propane tanks, the manufacturers. I think they have their own laws where they can and can't put different containers. Uh, you can buy propane a lot less expensive than those little containers that they hook up to the, contain to the campers. Uh, and as far as it says no decks, uh, you climb inside out those steps that those campers have, and if you're going to set any place for a couple months, you're going to, you want to put a little deck on there. Uh, most of these people are not young people, and they need a handrail. They need a little help to walk them down those steps. So this, uh, this is just great caution before anything's put in black and white and put into the ruling. I think there's got to be a lot more tweaking to this. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Any questions, Any questions? Mr. Fritz? Madam Chair, um, if 180 days is not the right amount of time in your mind, what would you make it? If you uh, have Wisconsin's got 365 days out of the year, and I have a campground there. Okay. If they can tolerate it and they can make their camper not freeze, they're going to be warm inside. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else wishing to address this issue? Uh, my name is Dennis Nelson. I'm probably most known as an advocate. Uh, I just bought a trailer, and this thing's really thrown a wrench in my whole day <laughs> at one of these places. There, there seems to be a lot of, you know, this is what we want, and this is what we want. Uh, basically, you're going to have hard feelings on both sides, no matter which way you go. Um, you know, it's, uh, like you were talking about those LP tanks. Uh, like with the tank that came with mine is uh, maintenance and serviced by a propane company. They come out, they check the gauges, hoses, they check the leaks, they check the seals before they fill them. Uh, that's the standard practice of uh, any of the propanes that deliver. I have a 125 gallon tank. Um, without that, uh, the ones that she's talking about don't even have a gauge on them, so if they leak, you may not even know it. Who's checking them? Uh, you go to, uh, let's say, Holiday Gas. They, got, they sell those tanks there. When you get them, do you know that there's nothing wrong with the valves? What I'm trying to say is, yes, you know, these little small ones are good, right, for what they're designed for. But they don't really have a check and balances like the other propane tanks do. Um, you know, you talk about, okay, I got a 125-pound tank. Let's say that uh, each, is, each of those uh, small ones are 20 pounds. What would be the common thing to do? if you enacted the manufactured one. Number two, manufacturing ones are no longer in existence on most of them. And a lot of times they get traded off when you get another one anyway. But in, in order to keep uh, a tank, uh, two tanks on a trailer or one tank, and if you run out, then you gotta run out and turn it on. Um, and then you run and take one tank back to get another one. I'm afraid that what it's going to turn into is, you know, the guy that uh, has these little small tanks will end up having five, six, seven of them sitting in the back of a truck uh, so that he doesn't have to keep running back and forth uh, to the place to get them. Um, and when you have that much, then you do have a safety problem. I mean, they, even in the gas stations where they keep them, they have to keep those in cages. Uh, there's a lot of different things that this ordinance is too vague on, on, on these things. Um, like the platform, the steps. Um, I have a wheel, my lady, she's in a wheelchair, power chair. With the way this thing is set up, she will not be able to get in my trailer. Now, right now I'm looking at a lift. Um, but the lift is going to be outside of that also. 
uh, in I'm thinking about calling uh, disability advocates and find out on that. See, there's a lot of other things that are affected by ordinances. And a lot of times, the people that are affected by it are the least ones recognized. What I guess what I'm saying is we need to, you know, the people that use the trailers, the people that do the ordinances, the people that own the, the different places, and a mediator is about the only way to really resolve this. I would really hate to see this gentleman here, Spade that was talking up here, take his business and just close it. That, is not, that will not be a good thing for Sioux Falls. It would not be a good thing for recreational people, and it's going to send a message across the country that nobody's going to want. Uh, are you seeing the magnitude of what we're looking at? Now, changing of ordinances sometimes are for the good. Sometimes they're for the bad. Parking meters out here used to be hitching posts. We no longer have to tie the Model A to the hitching post, which was an ordinance back in the 40s. <clears throat> now we got parking meters. It's a profitable thing to the city, and you don't have to get out of your car and take the rope over. So when we look at city ordinances and stuff, we need to start looking at what it affects compared to what we really, really need. Safety is a very big thing. Propane tanks are very dangerous things. One that's being regulated and taken care of by a, a company that has protocols and stuff in place is a lot better than having to go out here and they got to pick one up out of the thing and take it. Um, according, I think the way when I read that ordinance, the manufactured one that came with the trailer, that means it has to be refilled. Well, me and you both know that that would put the people that have those little tanks out. out. Uh, they hook to barbecue grills. They hook to different things. I just, you know, I don't know what to do. Uh, I just bought a trailer, and I'm uh, depending on what the decisions are going to be made here is going to decide what I'm going to do with that trailer if I'm just going to scrap it. You know, because of the, the, there's too vague of what do I need to do? What do I need to do, you know, to be able to do this? 180 days is not going to bother me, but it might bother some others. Uh, if I move my trailer, it's going to cost me uh, at least 150 to $500 every six months. I've already talked to somebody about moving up. Mine's uh, a little different than, the, it's a travel trailer. It's kind of like uh, it was built when both you know, they had that intermediate. Most people don't know about those. When they went from uh, the kind of like the mobile home travel that you take with you to the RV, there was a little gap in there uh, for a different type of trailer that met both standards. They had stove and everything in it. So are you seeing that we need to try to figure out how to make keep everybody happy without, uh, you know, too much upsetting of everybody? Uh, that's all I got to say. Thank you very much for your input. We, we appreciate it. Okay, we're going to close public testimony now. Oh, yes. Um, can we give those? One quick thing, and that's uh, be very quick. Um, one of the things about the people using them as a residence, um, the uh, uh, out-of-state people that use, uh, like she mentioned, a post box and that, they also have to have a physical address in order for voting rights. Mm -hmm. So that comes into play um, not so much now, but as they get older, then they might want to stay in that spot permanently. So you're dealing with a, a huge number. I know of over 4,000 in just one business that has uh, these people. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, call for the motion. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. I would make a motion uh, for approval on item 22. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? I guess I feel there have been a couple 
issues that have been raised that may be questionable that might need, lead us to changing the language a little bit. Um, if the LP tanks are in fact an issue, um, if we need to tweak the language about the accommodation away from the place of residence, a few things like that, then maybe it would be worthwhile to to have a meeting with some of these people and try to to get it changed. I agree with Lynette, and I, I hate to do this because this is my last night, and I know we're going on you know a number of rounds with this, but every every time we talk about this issue. I learned more than I ever thought that I would know, and my family are RVers, and I'm, I've learned more in the last 60 days than I ever knew. And I, I almost feel like it needs to be a task force or something needs to come together to try to bridge a few of these issues. I, I got even more uncomfortable tonight, and I, um, I know that we've talked around a lot of these, and there's some things that we are probably going to disagree about, but I agree with Lynette. You know, when you hear, practically speaking, some of the language, how it, it works into um, what could be adverse to life safety and some of the things that we're trying to fix, I get a little uncomfortable. Uh, my, I mean, my sense would be to, to defer it to allow that process to happen. Anita, how many times since I've been serving here have you and I not agreed with one another? <laughs> Kenny, I... I I've been trying not I'm to be I'm here to track. tell you I'm agreeing with you this evening. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow, Kenny. We're going out like that. That's great. I'm agreeing with Anita tonight. That's great. That's great. Okay. You're I think doing that to make me feel good. <laughs> I think what we need to do is um, go ahead and vote on the motion that's on the table and then um, take it from there. Motion has been made and seconded to approve. Yeah, substitute motion. What? need to do a substitute motion, otherwise we will deny the whole thing. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, we have a first and a second. Mm -hmm. Unless Kent wants to change his motion. We have a first and a second. You know, um, I, I really think that there's never going to be a 100% agreement on it. And so I think that uh, what, what's on the table is is reasonable, and I would like to proceed. Okay. Can I ask staff what happens if we deny it then? Sure. If it does get denied, then what's the next step? What's that? Uh, remember, you're making a recommendation to the city council, and the motion is to approve, so if the motion fails, then it would go on to the city council with whatever recommendation that motion passes. It will, you know, it would go, the vote would be reflected in what goes forward to the city council. And Shauna, it, since it is a recommendation to the city council, if there are minor changes, they would certainly have the ability to make those. Absolutely, the city council, council can, can make amendments as they see fit. Okay, thank you very much. There is a motion on the table and a second to approve item 22. Um, can I have a show of hands of those who would vote yes? No? Oh, you guys, we just can't seem to get through a meeting without this. <laughs> okay, I'm going to vote to approve. So the motion passes. Okay, item 23, conditional use permit in the C2 General Commercial District to allow the expansion of a non-conforming use at 405 South Willow Avenue. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before you tonight is a conditional use permit uh, to allow the expansion of a non-conforming use. The applicant is requesting the conditional use permit in order to add a second residential unit to the existing structure at this location. The applicant's name is Jacob Freddy, and I believe that he's represented here tonight by another part or by another person. The address is at 405 South Willow Avenue, and the area is 0.14 acres in size. The zoning is C2 General Commercial District with a land use of single-family residential. The comprehensive plan currently calls for this to be commercial 
and it does not need a future or does uh, it does not need a future land use change uh, to reconcile the, the difference in land uses because it's under five acres. Uh, a conditional use permit standard for pre-existing uses reads as an, an existing use eligible for a conditional use permit which was lawfully established on the effective date of this title shall be deemed to have received a conditional use permit as herein required and shall be provided with such permit by the city upon request. And it shall not be a it shall not be a non-conforming use provided, however, for any enlargement, extension, or relocation of such existing use. An application in con confirmation with this chapter shall be required. So essentially, what that says is that if it is a non-conforming use, it needs to have a conditional use permit to allow an extension or expansion of the use. Um, another conditional use permit standard to consider under this is that dwellings shall be located in areas where they are compatible with adjacent uses with regard to traffic size, density, and other significant factors. Some of the history of this location is that the subject property was rendered as a non-conforming use by the 1970 comprehensive rezoning of the city of Sioux Falls in anticipation of commercial redevelopment. That development has not yet occurred and may not, we're, you know, uh, and at this time the applicant is requesting allowance to add a second unit to the structure which would be located in the basement. Um, we are recommending approval of this, ordin of this conditional use permit with one condition in that the expansion of the on-site radiator shop, and I think it's actually a radial shop, so you have to forgive the type typo on that, uh, will not be allowed while non-conforming residential units exist on-site. So the condition, there is a radi radial shop in a garage behind the, behind the actual residential structure that exists as a non-conforming use, and that wouldn't change. What we the condition would basically say that that use would not be allowed to expand while there's residents also on that property. So that concludes staff report, and I can answer any questions you may have. Your recommendation, Dave, uh, uh, recommending approval, is subject to a, a plan check by zoning and building services. In other words, if an apartment is is relocated down there, it has to be a legal apartment. Right. I mean, so they'll have to get permits basement. for, you know, the, the actual construction of uh, the finishing off of the unit itself. And so, you know, that those types of plans would and have, to, have be. to meet off street parking regulations yep. and such like that. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So, Dave, you're saying they're going to have to shut the shop down that's there while they convert this into. No, no, no. What the condition would say is that th there's no expansion allowed of the existing shop while there's residential uses on this property. Okay. So it just would not allow the expansion of the non-conforming non commercial use there. Okay. And is it my understanding that this is being used as a duplex but is not supposed to be used as a duplex? I think, I think there is a second unit in there and, the, and this is to bring it up to uh, a co a compliance with, to okay. get the necessary approval. So. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions of Dave? Thank you very much, Dave. Is the petitioner here? <coughs> I'm Anita Engel, 2555 South Tijuana, number 248, and I represent Mr. Freddie, who owns the property. And uh, Marb's Auto Radio Repair Shop that is there is pretty much mostly closed down now. Not too many old cars where he repaired radios are in existence, and he's getting old and feeble, and not too much. He's been around for years. <laughs> what was your name again, ma'am? I didn't Anita hear. Anita Engel. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any questions of Ms. Engel? Okay, thank you very much. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this item? If not, call for a motion. I'll move for approval, Madam Chair. With one oh, with one stipulation. Yes, I'm sorry. I'll second. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item 23 <clears throat> passes. Item 24, 2009-04-06, conditional use permit in the O General Office District 
to allow multifamily residential at the southeast corner of North Sycamore, Sycamore Avenue and East Brennan Drive. Uh, the applicants are present here this evening to, uh, to talk to you. The applicant is uh, Doug Oman, Accessible Space Incorporated, and the owner is represented by Tim Johnson. At this location, uh, it's a, about a two-acre site. Existing use is vacant, and there is uh, some development along uh, Sycamore, North Sycamore, across from the high school, that is zoned for office institutional uh, they would request a conditional use permit to put in this accessible housing project. Uh, there is uh, incidents of similar projects in the neighborhood. At this particular location on the north side, there is a vacant uh, C-store and a C-4 commercial district. And to the south, there is an existing office in the O office district. To the east, it's RA1 residential and it's vacant, and to the west, it's S institutional which is an undeveloped portion of the Children's Home Society. Under the conditional use process, we are looking at areas where the housing would be compatible with adjacent uses with respect to traffic size, density, and other significant factors. We have reviewed the application for a two-story wood frame 15-unit apartment building with 12 one-bedroom units and three two-bedroom units and 7,500 square foot per floor. Building height is 26 foot 6 inches. An outdoor patio and porch entrance is indicated at the southeast corner of the building and access to a parking lot for 16 cars and a possible expansion in the future to accommodate conversion to a, uh, a regular market housing has been indicated on the property. A larger portion of the property is left undeveloped and the applicant may uh, respond to any questions about future development of that. We did have a caller uh, with, that asked about private covenants and deed restrictions that might apply to the project, and uh, the caller and the applicants have been in discussions and are prepared to talk to you this evening about that. Otherwise, we've had no other calls on the property, and staff is recommending approval of the conditional use permit as presented. In your addendum, there is a, a rendering of the project that shows the, the nature, the character of the uh, architectural design which appears to be compatible with uh, this neighborhood and uh, seems to fit well with, uh, with that type of development. And that concludes staff report. Any questions of Steve? Thank you, Steve. Is the petitioner present? My name is Doug Oman, and on behalf of Accessible Space, I'd like to thank the Commission for listening to us. Uh, Accessible Space is a nonprofit organization, nationally known, uh, largest developer of HUD 811 housing, and that's what the, we are proposing for this site. 811 housing is, to, is uh, designed to provide barrier free design for individuals with permanent disabilities. And uh, we feel this site is a good use uh, for a conditional use or for res multifamily residential. And it does neighbor a current existing site that Accessible Space developed just to the southeast, which is a senior housing as well. Uh, if there's any questions uh, the Commission might have, I'd be more than uh, happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, we did uh, meet, as was mentioned, with uh, the owner and a neighbor regarding a pr private covenant that's been created for the site. And uh, it is uh, my understanding that we've kind of agreed upon uh, terms that would allow for an, an amendment to that covenant that would uh, allow the project to move forward if it receives the conditional use permit. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you very much. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this issue? If not, we'll call for a motion. I'll move for approval of item 24. <laughs> oh, second. Sorry. <laughs> Motion's been made and seconded for approval of item 24. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion or uh, item number 24 passes. Number 25, 
2009-04-09 conditional use permit in the I-1 Light Industrial District to allow medical tissue processing at 4501 West 61st Street North. Thank you. Uh, the applicant is Christine M. Blitz of the South Dakota Alliance iBank. Uh, the purpose, as was just stated, was to propose, they're proposing to construct a building that would be dedicated to house a, t a tissue recovery center which is a relocation of where of um, several sites that they have right now. The general, the location of the site is at 40, uh, 4501 West 61st Street North. Um, for reference, it's right across from, right across 60th Street North from the new uh, University Center complex. Um, the area under consideration is 2.0 acres. I wrote in your staff report that the existing zoning is I-1 Light Industrial District and that, has, uh, that is not yet effective. You considered the zoning change last month at your meeting, and the city council approved that change on Monday night. Um, so I did want to bring that to your attention. The comprehensive plan calls for, calls for this location to be economic development, so it is in, con in conformance with the comprehensive plan. The conditional use permit standard um, relates to uh, the <coughs> medical waste material and, and processing operations being within an enclosed building, uh, material storage must be also fully enclosed and a site management plan outlining litter, odor, material processing and control measures to be reviewed uh, by, by departments including city health planning, building services, public works, fire and risk management. So there will be some oversight based upon um, the conditional use standard by our and other city departments. Uh, the applicant has indicated one of the, one of the uh, unique features of this project is that the applicant has indicated their intent to construct a building to lead standards, and that acronym stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Uh, and they may be able to further address what exactly that means and how that will impact or improve the project. Um, because the application has provided clarity to indicate the location, nature, and extent of the work proposed and requires a complete plan check by zoning and building officials prior to obtaining a building permit, we are recommending approval of the conditional use permit with one condition, and that is a condition you're familiar with, uh, referencing black ash, green ash, or other ash tree varieties shall comprise no more than 10% of the total deciduous tree count, as recommended by the city forester. And they'll need to submit a landscape plan at, their, at the time of their plan check. So we've received no phone calls on this item, and um, that concludes staff report. Thank you, Dave. Thank Any you. questions of Dave? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is the petitioner present? Hi, and thank you for uh, looking at this conditional use permit. They did not tell me I had to talk. So uh, could you give I'm us your name and address, oh, please, okay. ma'am? My name is uh, Christine Baylitz, and I'm the executive director of the South Dakota Lions Eye Bank. It's an organization of the Lions Clubs of South Dakota. And what we do there is bring the tissue that we recover from families that donate eyes, uh, skin, bone, connective tissue. We package most of it, and it's shipped out or put right into an operating room setting. But these guys informed us that we needed a conditional use for, pit for the uh, 24 hours or so that we have some biohazard waste there. So that's what okay, it's all Any about. questions of Christine? Christine, uh, I, I, you are currently at three locations, and this is going to be combining the three under one roof? Kind of. We um, right now are just south in the Jeske uh, built house that uh, it's on that corner of 22nd and Euclid. And so what we've been doing is using um, some funeral home locations for recoveries, the mm -hmm. morgues, those types of things. And so it makes it very hard to meet. We're regulated by the Food and Drug Administration as well as two other national associations. And when we were moving into this new facility, we have to come in compliance with the new 2005 FDA standards, which requires that we have a specific recovery room that meets specific requirements. And so that's the purpose of building the building a LEED certified for future growth. In this area, there's a tremendous amount of um, uh, growth in the need of using tissues that are donated by an individual, okay? Will you start construction on that this summer? Is this, uh, 
hope to be done by fall? Yep, uh, Saturday we, uh, the board approved everything and uh, everything is going through. Um, as soon as the Meredith Larson is, uh, Henry Carlson's helping us, so as soon as the building permits are allowed, then we're going to do start building immediately because we're in an area that Sanford purchased and they're going to start knocking stuff down July 1st around us. So, oh so we're okay. going. Thank How you. large an area do you cover? Is it just South Dakota or do you go into other states? We um, right now cover parts, most of South Dakota. We have a couple of hospitals that we don't work with on the tissue side, but for eyes, we cover all hospitals in South Dakota, 24 hospitals in Southwest Minnesota, about 32 in Northern Nebraska. And so we have three locations. We have one here in Sioux Falls, one in Aberdeen, and one in Rapid City because of the time constraints in getting to the donor uh, so that the cadaveric uh, processes don't get going too fast. And that's why that location is ideal for us because our access to the interstates are perfect. Any other questions of Christine? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this item? If not, we'll call for the motion. Madam Chair, I'll move for approval with the one stipulation on item 25. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Number, uh, item 25 passes. Item 26, 2009-04-14 conditional use permit in the C2 General Commercial District to allow an on-sale alcohol establishment at 2019 South Minnesota Avenue. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I spoke with the uh, petitioners uh, earlier today. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were still working with city engineers on a parking plan that would meet the city requirements as well as the zoning requirements for the number of parking stalls. They had not quite reached an agreement yet. Although they did not request a deferral, I recommended that to them. And if they're not here or present here this evening, uh, that would be my recommendation to you, that you defer ap this application to allow the applicant more time to work with city engineers on their parking plan. Okay. Any questions of Steve? Can we see if anybody is here? Yes. Yeah, is the Steve? petitioner here? I didn't see you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, since, the pit, since the petitioner is not here, um, is there anyone from the audience wishing to address this? Okay. Call for the motion. I'll make a motion to defer item number 26. <clears throat> I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded to defer. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item 26 is deferred. Item 27, 2009-04-17, a minor amendment in sub-area A of the Southern Hills Plan Development District to allow increased building signage and a flat roof at East 57th Street and MacArthur Lane. Staff report. Uh, just a little background. Uh, this project has been in the works for some time now. It's for a KFC uh, restaurant located on the subject property. It's in a planned development district that allows retail, trade and service, including the KFC on the project or on the site. In the process of pursuing that project, uh, uh, some of the signage requirements uh, came into play that uh, the restaurant was uh, uh, asking for a signage uh, and uh, architectural design that didn't quite meet the sub-area regulations and therefore were presenting to you this evening a request for a minor amendment that would allow some increased building signage and a flat roof design. We have uh, in your addendum a letter from an adjacent or a neighboring property owner that uh, is not opposed to the project but has made some recommendations uh, to you. Uh, that they would like to see addressed in the consideration of the signage and of the flat roof design. Uh, I believe the applicant also has a copy of that letter. 
and uh, you have it. Instead of reading through it, it's quite a lengthy letter I'd like to summarize. Basically, they would like the signage uh, limited to no more than a uh, 7 by 5 uh, sign, and the applicant has provided also in your addendum a sign that addresses that requirement. <laughs> so we have, we have cooperation here. It's just that we need to get through, uh, through the application. Uh, the other thing that the, app, that the uh, letter indicated was that they would like to make sure that all of the landscaping plans that have been put into place here for the restaurant are implemented, that they are uh, provided as being proposed. And I believe that that has been done uh, in the three applications that we are going to look at tonight, this being the first one. Uh, you will see that the landscaping that is being proposed does conform to the ordinance, does conform to the sub-area regulations, and does meet the intent uh, requested by the, the person who wrote this letter of concern. So I'll go through that quickly here for the minor amendment. To that extent, uh, the applicant uh, is proposing a KFC design, as you see, uh, presented here. Uh, you can see that the building has a, a major portion being a flat roof. One segment of the building, however, does have a pitched roof feature. And uh, the person who was concerned about that indicated in their letter that if there were some pitched roof uh, features provided that they would be okay with that. Uh, I'm not sure what the discussion was between that person and the, and the KFC folks uh, and their representatives, the developer, so they'll have to address that. As far as I know, they've reached an agreement on, on the flat roof design. As far as the signage is concerned, you see also on the building elevations, there's a, um, a logo type signage of uh, Colonel Sanders' image. and. Uh, the two locations for that would be on the east side of the building and on the north side of the building. Uh, the 7 by 5 proposed signage by itself uh, meets the ordinance requirements and the signage requirements of the ordinance. However, two of them e exceeds the requirement. In other words, we're over 100 square foot when only the 5 by 7 would be allowed. Uh, building signage is not transferable from one elevation to another. That's the ordinance. But as you can see, uh, the building signage, we feel, has been minimized through the use of this uh, type of signage, and no other signage is proposed. And that's our understanding of the minor amendment. The reason that the limitation on signage was so severe was because uh, when the sub-area regulations were set up for this planned development, we referred to O-Office signage. And obviously this is not an office, it's a restaurant, and their requirements are a little different. I think as long as, um, as there has been some agreement between the neighborhood and the developers on the signage issue, staff is uh, willing to support that with a recommendation for approval. And we've had no other calls on that. Uh, our recommendation, as you can see, does have uh, two stipulations. One of them has been uh, taken care of. Uh, the first one is wall signage is limited to that shown on the building elevation submitted. We have that in front of us, so that's taken care of. Now the second one, we were, they did have some uh, what they call expression panels which would be wall signage also on the building. Uh, the person who, from the neighborhood who wrote the letter was opposed to any additional signage. And uh, when I talked to the applicant, um, it's my understanding that those signage signs are not being proposed and they're not included on the building elevation. So there's only one stipulation for approval and that's wall signage limited to that shown on the building elevation submitted. And so we can strike number two? And strike number two. And that concludes staff report. Thank you, Steve. Are there any questions of Steve? Okay, thank you very much. Is the petitioner here?
<clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Gene Dunow. We're a KFC franchisee, our family. Um, any questions? Any questions? Uh, these guys work, we try to cooperate with whatever is necessary. Uh, in my past experience, the only thing on signage is that we try to be competitive. Well, in this area, most of the signs are uh, fairly limited. So it's a competitive situation with signage in, in the sense that you want to fit in with the neighborhood. Uh, if you're in Las Vegas, you have a different sign. Uh, so the signage here is going to work for us. And I don't know if you've seen the color rendering of the, uh, of the project. I think it's going to be a, a beautiful project and uh, uh, with the water feature out front and the rest. So I have no problem with anything that we've gone through. I think it'll be a nice addition to that stretch of 57. I hope so. I, I really look forward to it. Okay, hold on just a second. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this item? Okay, if not, I will call for the motion. I'll move for approval of uh, item number 27 with uh, can't remember, one stipulation. Mm -hmm. I'll second. <laughs> okay, motion's been made and seconded. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item 27 passes. Item 28, 200904 18, a minor amendment in sub area A of the Southern Hills Plan Development District to allow a 58 square foot monument sign. Eight feet in height at East 57th Street and MacArthur Lane. This application is indirectly related to the KFC project, um, and that indirect relationship is best reflected in a replatting of the property to provide additional frontage for MacArthur Square, which is a, a mixed use development behind the KFC, to have a freestanding sign out on 57th Street. Uh, so the two projects are being coordinated together, and here's where the landscaping comes in that, that the letter uh, addressed a concern about, that they were concerned that the landscaping as presented is going to get done. Um, as we look at the yellow area on the screen, that is the portion of additional street frontage that is being provided to uh, the MacArthur Square development to the south in order to calculate the freestanding signage requirements that it could have then. In so doing, uh, then the KFC project then no longer had any frontage, street frontage, except for the upper northeast corner of the property, which was reduced to 24 feet. Well, KFC was not proposing a freestanding sign anyway. But by maintaining the 24-foot frontage, they were allowed a street address uh, to 57th Street. And MacArthur Square is requesting signage, freestanding signage for their project on 57th Street. And in doing that, they've provided us with a landscaping plan that meets the requirements of the sub-area regulations for development of that whole section of the PD, both MacArthur Square and the KFC. It's just that it kind of runs together there. So the landscaping that's shown on this request for a freestanding sign at the corner for MacArthur Square should be approved along with the sign. That way the resident who is the neighborhood resident who is concerned about this could be assured that the landscaping will be put in the way it's being approved. Now, the sign itself is a little bit bigger than what's allowed, even with the, with the street frontage. If you look at the calculations based on street frontage and the O office district 
requirements, 48 square foot, 6 foot and high would be allowed for the street frontage shown. And what they're proposing is 58 square feet, 8 foot high. I can address the 8 foot high because the sign is being located in a lower portion of the site and so the effectively it's starting two foot lower than what it normally would on a flat site. So really there's only six feet of sign that's showing, so I, I think the intent is being met with uh, sign height. The applicant should address with you the need for 58 square foot of signage rather than the 48 square feet allowed. I don't know what the rationale is. You have a sign design in front of you that shows a number of panels, sign panels for tenants, obviously of MacArthur Square, which include office and commercial uh, businesses. But, but I'm not an expert on just how much signage each panel should have in order to meet their requirements for adequate signage, and I would leave that to the applicant to explain to you. Otherwise, we feel that it's a, a reasonable proposal, a reasonable uh, approach to solving a number of problems on the two properties, and uh, we would recommend approval of the minor amendment for the 58 square foot sign and the 8 foot height. Thank you, Steve. Any questions of Steve? Okay, thank you very much. Is the petitioner here? Daryl Virick with Virick Commercial Real Estate, 812 South Minnesota Avenue. Uh, one of the reasons that we had to go this way is that we have such a big site and so little street frontage because MacArthur dead ends, you know, couple, what, two, three hundred feet coming in on the side. And so trying to work this around, also our building is 32,000 square feet on the main floor. Now, I know that's a big building but it's not anywhere near the size we could have put on the site originally. But that's kind of the issue we've got with the number of tenants because of the how many uh, businesses are going to be on that main floor to get that increased signage. I mean, if we had MacArthur running all the way along that side, this wouldn't even be an issue. Sure. Okay. Any questions of Daryl? Madam Chair, uh, Daryl, the uh, water feature that was mentioned earlier, oh. what can you Oh yeah, there's going to be a pond out front, similar to um, well, it'll be it'll be nicer than uh, the one at 69th of Minnesota. It's going to have a fountain in it, and also that sign sets back, so the south pillar of that sign, and that's why we went with a pillar sign, is actually that sign is going to that pillar is out in the pond, so it's set off of the street, and that's why we went with the kind of sign we did, is because we got to drop that pillar into the into the water feature there. And then we'll have fountain and landscaping around there. And I'm guessing it uh, would be probably the bus company would have one of those little uh, protector areas for people to wait for the bus right out front there, too. I think that's incorporated in there. Oh, we're seeing the picture now. That looks very nice. And yeah, that, uh, mm -hmm. that pond would be a nice addition. Yep. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons we did that. It used to be on the side. On the east side of Kentucky Fried Chicken, we swung it out to the north to move everybody farther back off the street because we figured it would be better looking and take us farther away from the neighbors. Okay, any questions of Daryl? Thank you, Daryl. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this item? If not, uh, um, call for a motion. I'll move for approval of item 28. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? I just want to add that, you know, I, I know we talk a lot about signage and staying in conformance, but I think when you see it relative to how it's embedded in the pond and the overall scale of that project, it, I'm pretty comfortable in deviating from the standard. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be appropriate and nicely done. Okay. I would agree. I know those science standards are labored over um, intensely by various committees and um, that we often keep our feet to the fire on that. I do think uh, overall it's um, going to be a really, um, it'll be validated for the size of the project and I think with how it'll look overall. So 
I agree. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Item 28 passes. Item 29. 2009-03-15 Final Development Plan in Subarea A of the Southern Hills Plan Development District to construct a fast food restaurant with a drive-through window at East 57th Street and MacArthur Lane. And now the three projects come <laughs> together. <laughs> so, uh, really, the Southern Hills Plan Development District uh, was. Uh, set up to create a small office and retailing complex to exemplify quality through landscaping and a standard of quality construction. We believe that it has done that now with, uh, with this uh, application uh, because really the intent of the plan development district is to encourage creative higher quality design and ecologically sensitive urban design with uh, special consideration given to projects which incorporate desirable design features such as we've seen. Uh, there is a mutual access to the project from South MacArthur Lane. If you uh, look at the, uh, again, at the letter that was included in your information packet or your addendum packet from the concerned neighbor, uh, there was a mention of a deceleration lane uh, helping with traffic problems or perceived traffic problems on 57th. There was a meeting with city engineering to review that condition and city engineering said that does not warrant a deceleration lane at the present time or any special signalization at that intersection. <clears throat> uh, the letter goes on to say that if this can't be included in the present project, they would like to see it done as soon as possible. They believe that there is a traffic hazard at that intersection which will become uh, aggravated with uh, additional commercial use. Staff has taken note of that. I believe the Planning Commission has also uh, discussed it in the past and heard testimony. Uh, hopefully that issue can be resolved sooner than later. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, we don't want accidents to happen before we take steps to prevent them. Of course, the front yard setback is certainly met by the introduction of the BMP. We're at 60-foot setback to, from 57th Street for the building. Creates a nice setting for the building. Actually gets the building visually back uh, uh, away from uh, neighbors who were concerned about that. The uh, design of the building does fit the re architectural requirements of the sub-area regulations. Again, the letter that's in your information packet uh, as an addendum uh, states uh, support for uh, the stucco treatment of the building and also the, uh, as indicated in the rendering, the earth tone colors that are being applied. And so I think that issue is, has been put to rest. Based on a building size of 3,500 square feet and we do not have a seating plan, there is a 35 parking space requirement and 35 spaces are provided. A total of 14 trees appear to be located on lot 6A. Again, because of the reduced street frontage, the reduction in landscaping requirements uh, for this particular project um, come into play, but we just approved a minor amendment that made up for those tree plantings with the freestanding sign, because now they had to provide the, all the additional landscaping out along the street in the front yard. So we're okay there. They also had to uh, meet the requirement of screening the residential uses to the west. Uh, they would be allowed a freestanding sign, but none is uh, proposed. They are proposing three directional signs on the indicated around the parking lot entrance and toward the drive up window. And now the 37.2 square foot uh, logo sign on the north and east building wa walls approved by minor amendment come into play, so you can, you can note that on your staff report if you like. Previous neighborhood concerns have been addressed for traffic, safety, design, construction, and maintenance of proposed improvements to the existing BMP. All of that has been resolved through minor amendments and now with approval of the final development plan. Plan is complete for your consideration and uh, action. 
Staff is recommending approval of the final development plan with stipulations. The first one being to coordinate the landscaping shown at the southwest corner of the property with the landscaping on adjacent lot 5A to provide a landscape screen incorporating berms and coniferous trees planted at 20 foot interval spacing between residential and non residential uses. Because the landscaping is being provided for two separate projects, we feel it necessary to put the stipulation that those two be coordinated. Uh, the second one that approved minor amendment to allow increased freestanding signage and heights on lot 5A, um, that's been done. And the third one approved minor amendment for increased wall signage and a flat roof for KFC, and that's also been done. So you're saying we can strike those last you two? You can strike the last two. Those uh, two have been approved. It's the first one that is the main concern. Okay. Uh, that concludes staff report. Okay, any questions of Steve? Thank you very much, Steve. Is the petitioner here? I guess I knew you were here. I should have just said we just step forward. Uh, Jean Dunau again. And the thing is, they have my name misspelled. It's D-U-E-N-O-W, not D-U-C. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any questions of Jean? I have a very important question. How's the grilled chicken? Oh, it's wonderful. Is it good? Oh, it's good. <laughs> I live a block away. Oh, it's delicious. <laughs> Thanks. That's all I got. Your, yeah. And we're going to have the buffet. So with oh, the, don't tell me that. Oh, no. <laughs> the buffet is great. It, it, you know, you can get, go anything. You can have a salad. You can have vegetables. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, we also have bread pudding for, you know. <laughs> you should have brought us some samples. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, I do want to ask you if you're here past 10. Yeah. <laughs> I do also want to note that I do, uh, your improvements that you've made to your other locations throughout the city are very nice. I don't know if those are your locations yeah, as the well. Two, South Minnesota and, and uh, Qantas are ours, and this will look a lot like that um, with the earth zones. And the, they look nice. Yeah, and that's the national. We, we get this is they design these, they come up with these design criteria and so forth. And uh, I notice there's a lot of things been mentioned about landscaping. In our business, landscaping now is a competitive issue. I mean, you, you look at the m newer modern places, you, you, they will have very nice ma landscaping in them. So it, it's a matter of being competitive and fitting in with the community. And that's, that's really important. For us, I think I think is important for the community. So, uh, we want to be a good good neighbor to everybody. I know our neighbors out there have been very concerned. Uh, we, as a company, as a franchisee, have operated at absolutely right next door. In other words, with the just across the fence in at least two locations for over 25 years, we've never had any complaints which means uh, it's a credit to the managers out there that they're, they're taking care of business. They're making sure the neighborhoods are kept clean, uh, that we're not having problems. Of course, we don't stay open very late at night, which that's a, another issue. Uh, we're, we stay open until 10, and that's about it. And uh, uh, I doubt we'll be open after that anytime soon. So. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone from the audience wishing to address this item? Okay, if no one, a call for the motion. Madam Chair, I for approval with the no stipulation on item 29. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor of item 29, or approving item 29? Aye. 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 Opposed? Item 29 passes. Um, item 30, 2009-03-10, <laughs> preliminary subdivision plan for University Hills addition to develop mixed use residential and commercial and single family residential at the northwest corner of North Marion Road and West 54th Street North. Staff report. Okay. The main exhibit here, of course, is the zoning exhibit that you acted on previously. 
that's one of the reasons we asked for subdivision plans and zoning uh, requests to uh, proceed simultaneously so that we know that the subdivision plan fits the zoning. And I believe the, uh, the engineer for that project is still with us this evening. He drew the short straw. <laughs> The, um, this will go forward together with the rezoning request on June 1st to the City Council. Uh, the same breakdown in lots and acres are what was shown in the rezoning plan. Uh, it totals 85 lots on 79.8 acres. There is a systematic lot and block numbering pattern, lot lines and street and road names uh, being provided and phases for purposes of identifying final plan parcels based on watershed boundaries is also provided. And it was indicated to you previously what the first phase of development would be. They are providing other plans along with this that uh, uh, may be important to adjacent property, property owners, which would include preliminary drainage and grading plans, uh, preliminary utility plans, conformance with the comprehensive plan, and the required property area and required area for lots in the underlying zoning districts. Uh, they also conform with the major street plan. We have a recommendation for the, from the city engineering department for approval. There are final plans that will have to go through um, uh, review yet uh, before they could actually do some subdividing, uh, platting, and, and development. And the access issues on uh, on uh, into the subdivision are currently being reviewed, uh, they have to apply separately for those access points, and so they're not being approved with your plan this evening. Uh, we've had no calls on this. Uh, I believe that uh, there is an agreement with the adjacent property owner. You notice in the northeast corner of the subject subdivision that there's an existing right-of-way uh, that is shown into the corner of the property, and both uh, property owners have to uh, petition for vacation of that right-of-way in order for this to work, and I believe they've come to agreements on that. So uh, the plan in front of you would uh, resolve that issue in the future. And that concludes staff report. Thank you, Steve. Any questions of Steve? Thank you. Uh, the petitioner, please. Good evening. I'm Monty Miller from Sayer Associates, uh, 216 South Duluth Avenue. And I don't know if I call two and a half hours apart simultaneous or not. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we're here and, yeah, and happy to be part of this exciting project and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. As far as the vacation of uh, Northview Lane, we are working with the developer, or excuse me, the landowner ADP to the north and it looks like we're getting pretty close to getting those issues settled uh, between the two property owners, so that's going well, and we hope to get that taken care of in the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Is uh, anyone have any questions of Monty? I feel like we should ask Monty a lot of questions. <laughs> all I don't think Monty would like that. <laughs> no <night>. question. <laughs> it looks nice, Monty. It'll be yeah, exciting yeah. when it... Turn the first shovel off no, there. Yeah. It really does. It's a very exciting project. I guess we have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for hanging around. <laughs> Anyone from the audience wishing to address item 30? If not, call for the motion. Motion to approve item 30. I'll second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, looks like we adjourn. Motion to adjourn. It would be my honor to second that. Good, good for you. Motion's been made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. We are adjourned.